Hello, and welcome everybody to this two-day real estate investing bootcamp put on by myself, Gabby, and Wayne with the Real Estate Investing Masters. We are super happy to have you all here with us today, and we're really excited to get started. So I think we're going to do just that. We're going to get started. What do you say, Wayne? Yeah, sorry. There was just something funny about the way you said this today, as in like, as opposed to tomorrow. Uh, <laughs> I don't know day. why I got this today, not as in today. Okay. I don't know, just call it a dad joke. But uh, yeah, we're very super excited for this today boot camp uh, about real estate investing. We're going to be teaching you guys how to create financial freedom and uh, and how to invest in real estate in Canada. Uh, let's get right into it. I'm already butchering it. <laughs> okay, so we wanted to start out with this uh, little quote from our good friend, Benjamin Franklin. He yeah. said a uh, long time ago that an investment in knowledge pays the best interest. And we just wanted to really um, take this time to congratulate all of you for investing this time today, being here and getting educated. Um, some of you may be watching this recorded later. So mm -hmm. congratulations to later you for taking the time to uh, dedicate to this to get some further education. Yes, it's not always just about an investment in money, but also an investment in time. You guys spent this time, um, you know, learning about this and, and, and for, for whatever reason that may be uh, to, to better your future. So um, hats off to you guys and, and a big applause. Absolutely. Okay. So who are we? Who is Wayne and Gabby Hillier? So we are uh, both full-time real estate investors. Uh, we've been invest investing uh, for over a decade. We own and manage a rental portfolio. We own a rent to own business, uh, also a mortgage financing business. Um, we are creative real estate investing experts. We love that creative stuff. It's really Wayne's uh, jam. He digs it. Love creative real estate. <laughs> love creative. Love creative. We're going to get into lots of creative real estate this, uh, uh, this weekend as well. Yeah, and uh, we've completed many flips, burrs. Um, we've done lots of suite conversions, adding secondary suites, um, agreement for sales, lots of wholesale deals. So we've kind of, we're pretty well-rounded and uh, touching all the different kind of strategies within real estate investing. We are co-hosts of the Real Estate Investing Morning Show podcast, which we do live Monday to Friday at 6 a.m. Mountain Time on the Podbean app. So if you're familiar with the show, but you haven't joined us live, um, you should do that. Just hop on the Podbean app and join us live at 6 a.m. Otherwise, it gets uploaded to all of your favorite podcasting uh, platforms. So you can listen later to the recorded version as well. Hmm. And I'm going to add as well, uh, for those of you guys that don't know, it's uh, we offer free coaching on the show every morning. So free real estate investing coaching. Any questions you guys have when you join the live show, you just uh, put it in the chat. Any questions you have, and we will answer it for free. And um, we do that um, because we believe that everyone should have access to free coaching. Everyone should have free ac access to free education. And so we, that's why we do the show every morning. Um, we also you know, do other stuff too. We read uh, articles and stuff like that and keep you up to date on what's going on in the real estate uh, world. Um, but, you know, please, you know, if you guys are struggling, you know, getting started and you don't have a whole heck of a lot of money to invest into your education or coaching, there's free, there's access to free education. We do that for you guys. Um, so anything that uh, we don't cover uh, today, uh, feel free or any questions that you guys have um, that we don't have time to answer today. Feel free to, you know, come out to the show uh, every morning and ask your questions. And if you can't make it um, that early, for whatever reason, life is getting in the way, just send us an email to info at reimorningshow.com and ask your question and then I'll, I'll answer it the next day. And then if I have the time and I remember, I'll even email you back and say, uh, hey, I answered your question this morning. Um, go have a listen with the link. So um, awesome. no excuses. Um, we also run the Real Estate Investing Master's Mentorship Program. And um, outside of real estate investing, uh, we have an eight-year-old daughter, Everly, um, pictured a lot younger in this photo here on the slide. Um, she's tall now and sassy, and and we love her. <laughs> we also have two pesky dogs. Um, and myself, um, outside of real estate, I'm really passionate about bringing women together, and I facilitate uh, women's circles, and I also run uh, vision boarding workshops. So that's kind of a little bit on the outside of real estate about me. Wayne, do you have anything to add? Uh, you know what? Um, 
I'm just realizing now that like it's it's funny when uh the who we are and like the way we introduce ourselves has changed so much over the last decade that like it's funny people used to like I used to be like oh I like this and I do this for work and um I like playing ball I, I love I love watching Jeopardy with dinner um like uh and uh and I like playing chess like you know what I mean like it's 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 funny how like it's the way we introduce ourselves is just like we're full-time real estate investors our life is business and real estate investing and we love it and it's all we do and um it, it's no longer uh, about our hobbies or anything like that so yeah I I I love watching uh Jeopardy with dinner it's my favorite um I love competing with Gabby at dinner time, and then every morning uh when we wake up or sorry after our podcast and we did a little bit of work uh, we have breakfast together and we play chess every morning it's, and it's lovely um something you didn't know about us maybe um in fact Gabby if you don't mind uh maybe you could share something with with everyone that um that uh that, that nobody knows maybe share something that nobody knows about you well fact that nobody knows about me yeah yeah, let them, let them get to know us a little bit better than 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 what they hear on the podcast or or what we share with them today. I don't know. You've stumped me. Um, can you think of anything? I don't know. Can we come back to this? <laughs> uh, I have one. You do? Okay. Gabby. Is it embarrassing? No. Okay, go. Just go. Gabby uh, used to um, play roller derby. Yes, I did. Played yeah. roller derby back in the day for a few years. Yeah. My yeah. uh, derby name was Gypsy Roller. Yeah. Fun times. There you go. Something you didn't know about Gabby. <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to do this as a new thing. Every time we, we, uh, we hold an event, I'm going to see if I can pull something out that uh, nobody knows about Gabby. I think it's cool. Awesome. Uh, we're, we're just, you know what? I, I just want to add that, um, you know, as we go through this, this weekend, we're going to be sharing all the things, you know, we do and all the possibilities of real estate and, and how it's changed our life. But um, to be completely honest with you, uh, I love, I love to, I love to humble us as much as possible. I love to share um, the fact, and I want you guys to know, and this is something that's really important to us, is that we are just normal, regular people that used to have jobs. And we started investing in real estate and we built some businesses and it changed our life and we left our jobs and now we are full-time entrepreneurs. And I think that sharing this with you guys and, and being humble and showing our humble beginnings um, allows you, uh, it gets more um, relatable. And I do not want to put my, us up on some pedestal like we're some amazing, you know, um, extraordinary individuals, like that only we can do it. We want to share with you guys that real estate investing, anyone can do it. And and I, I hope that this relatability and this vulnerability um, and transparency uh, helps you with that and makes it much more real. That's what we want. We want to show you how incredibly real and possible it is. So you guys actually go and do it and create the life of your dreams. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. So what to expect today? So this is kind of the agenda of what we're going to be going through. Um, actually, today and tomorrow. So this is the agenda for both days. Today and Two tomorrow. Days and tomorrow. And tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So we're going to be going over what is real estate investing? How is it different from stocks? Yeah. The way to succeed in real estate investing? How to buy a rental property? Mm -hmm. We're going to go over how to analyze markets, how to find deals, how to fund those deals. Yes. Yes. We're going to talk and, a lot about that today on how, yeah. to, how do you get the money for it? Yeah. Um, and then getting into tomorrow, we're going to be talking about the different real estate investing strategies, how much money you can make off of those strategies. Yeah. And at the very end of tomorrow, we're also going to be um, talking a little bit about the Real Estate Investing Master's Mentorship Program and uh, that opportunity. So if it's something that you're interested in investing in, you can stick around to the end of day two and we'll be going over that. Yes. So we shared lots of, we're going to be going over a free boot camp today, give you guys all of the, the fundamentals of real estate investing and everything that we just listed. Um, we also have access to free education and, and coaching every morning on our REI Morning Show podcast. Um, we want you to take full advantage of that. Now, if you are ready to, to, take, to, to take it to the next level and you are looking for more resources and workshops and courses and, and guidance and education and how to build a roadmap and all that stuff, and you want full access to us, um, we'll be talking about that tomorrow. Um, just stick around at the end uh, and we'll give you all the information about that. We got a really cool opportunity and offer that we're going to be sharing as well. 
Um, I'm trying not to be too salesy or pitchy, but I, I want you to get excited about it. And I think it's really cool. And we put a lot of time and effort into building this and we've had a lot of success stories. Um, so I think it's, I, I think I, I have a responsibility to share that. Um, but I'm not going to try and make you, I'm not going to make it into some sales pitch or anything else. Like I, I want you, it's only if it's right for you guys. And it's only if you like us as well. I think that's important. Um, don't join it if you don't like us. Yeah. Don't join anything. Don't join any coaching program unless you like the people. You have to, you have to, you have to, you have to like them and that, that, what they're, it has to resonate with you. So anyways, Absolutely. let's get into the free education. Let's get that? into it. Yeah. So uh, we have a really, another really good buddy, uh, Mark Twain. Who, old friend, old friend, old friend who a uh, very long time ago said, buy land, they're not making it anymore. Yeah. And um, still true to this day. So they're not making any more land. And um, I think that um, uh, Elon Musk is uh, will be selling um, plots of land on, on Mars pretty soon, though. So don't, <laughs> don't, 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 don't get ahead okay. of yourself, Gabby. I mean, like, that's what I'm saying. But I think what we're getting at here is I think that um, all of you are here because you know the power of real estate investing and you want um, to build wealth for your future and for your future generations and all that. So um, I think we're all here for the same reasons and um, we're going to get go over a lot of that education here today. So we're excited to dive into that. 90% of millionaires were made through real estate, right? I think you guys have all read the same books. Maybe you read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, maybe a Maybe you read the the first ABCs of real estate or whichever else, or you heard some podcast, or you listen to ours, or you watch some YouTube video. Uh, I think we all realize the the opportunities that are available with investing in real estate, and we're going to be sharing those opportunities with you guys today, and and hopefully give you guys a better understanding. But gosh, golly, I love real estate. <laughs> okay, so what, what is, is real it? investing? <laughs> what is it? <laughs> yeah. So real estate investing involves the purchase, ownership, management, or rental of properties with the expectation of generating income, profit, or long-term appreciation and value. Investors may engage in various strategies, including buying and holding properties, wholesaling and flipping, which is just to name a few. Yeah. And as we mentioned in day two, we're going to be going over kind of all of the different types of strategies and um, getting more in-depth into those. So, yeah, how much money you can make. So that's the basis of of what real estate investing is: it's the purchase of of land, as we talked about on the previous slide, buy buy it, yeah. and um, generate some income from it. Okay. So one of the first questions that people kind of ask when they're learning about real estate is, how is it different from stock investing? So you know, if you're thinking about you know building a better future for yourself, you kind of look at the opportunities, and there's usually you're usually staring stock investing and real estate in the in the eyes. Yeah. So Wayne, can you kind of go over some of the um, differences between the two? Yeah, I, it reminds me of when I um, when I was I was building up my career. I was in my early twenties, and I was uh, this is when I first started thinking about real estate investing. And uh, what had happened was I got my big raise. Um, I got that ticket, and then I got that big raise. And I don't know, call it like a early twenties midlife crisis. I was going through a bit of a, a bit of a crisis because a lot of things were changing my life. And then it was all happened rapidly between like the age of 21 to like 24 or something like that. And I was building a career and I met the girl in my dreams. We're talking about getting married, talking about having kids and stuff like that. I, I, I reached the, the ceiling. I, I, I peaked, I peaked, um, at work and I, I, I got the ticket and I'm like, okay, I'm not going to make much more. The only real, uh, way up is, is through like, I don't know, I'm going through like that tiny little uh, funnel of like all the technicians who can get into management. So like my big thing was like, okay, I'm going to climb the corporate ladder and I'm going to get into management. I'm going to get into upper management. And I don't know. It's just, it, it's, it seemed like there was so much happening in life and so much opportunity. And then it all just kind of like went like this. And I look at myself and I'm like, you know, whatever I was 24 years old. And I look, I'm like, is this my life? Is this, this is all I have for the next 40 years until I retire. I'm just going to be this guy. I'm going to make this money. I'm going to have a kid and that's it. And it was, I, I, I you know what, I'll, I'll say it. It was like an early, like midlife crisis. Like I, I, my, my existence was being questioned and my, my potential. And I don't know. I just, you know, when you, when you spend your early twenties, you know, just reaching for the stars and then you kind of get there. It's like, oh crap. Like what's, what's, what am I doing here? And so I started having, um, I started thinking a little bit more about like what other opportunities and, and side hustles I can get into. And also I was also thinking about like, what am I, 
what am I doing with my life and my future and, you know, becoming a dad and thinking about that type of stuff. And, and what am I going to do about, you know, education and retirement and stuff like that. So I really started changing my focus on, on what I was putting my energy and my, and my, 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 my thoughts into. And so I started thinking about investments and I was looking at it. And first thing everybody does, they look at stocks. So they look at real estate, right? Like which one's which what's, what's different. And they are two very, very different, um, uh, investment uh, types and what I what I what I really liked about real estate was that it's a hard asset it's something I can touch you know you can you can buy shares in a company uh, on your phone on TD you know um, investment app or something like that and wait, there it is you own the shares and you you watch the market and the the value of the share can go like this or it can go like this and then you just watch your the value of your investment going up and going down right and hopefully it goes up a little bit more over time um the hard asset i can go drive by it i can touch it and i can do stuff to it and i have control over its success and that's what i love the most about it is because if i go buy coke uh, coca shares in coca-cola uh, it's not like I'm going to be sitting on the board. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I don't own enough shares to to have any say. I can buy it, right? I can buy them at the store. I can buy a case. I can tell my friends to go buy it. And hopefully, you know, the the, pro the profits do really well that year. But I have zero control over it. If I buy a hard asset, I buy, I buy a rental property. I have total control over it. I also have total responsibility, which I love. I am 100% in control of its success and its failure. I cannot blame anyone else other than myself. And I freaking love that. I love it. I'm sure a lot of you guys do too, as entrepreneurs, as the type of people that want to get into something like this, you kind of, you're kind of, I don't want to call you a control freak, but you, you like to be in control. You want to succeed and you're in, in, in a, you, you like being a part of it. You want to be in control of it. So I like the control over its success and its failure. I, I love that accountability to it. I love that I, if it's not performing well, I can fix it. I can change it. I, I can do something. If it is performing well, then I can, I, you know, I'm, I, I, I can pat myself on the back. Now, the other the big thing about um, the difference between uh, stock investing and, and real estate investing is that, um, see, if you want to buy shares in a company, you have $100,000 and you want to invest it and you want to buy Coca-Cola shares, you take the $100,000 and you buy, you know, whatever, 100,000 shares or however, however much it costs. But you have $100,000 in that investment. And what you're hoping is that the shares in Coca-Cola go up or they go down. And as they go up by percentage, the percentage uh, equal to will uh, your your investment will increase. If the share goes up by 5%, you, your $100,000 investment goes up by 5%. If it goes down, it goes down. Right? And real estate is very similar. If you buy an asset, you buy a house and it goes up in value, then yes, you, you know the value of your investment will go up. But the cool thing about um, real estate investing is that you can leverage mortgages financing there is no more there's no financing for stock investing you can't you can't say hey bank i'm gonna buy a uh, hundred thousand dollars worth of coca-cola shares i'm gonna give you 20 percent, and i'd like you to finance 80 percent of it they don't do that but they will do that for a piece of real estate and that's a very cool thing if we're just talking a very one dimensionally about buying a house and the value of the house going up or going down forgetting about the other profit centers you buy a house you want to buy a five hundred thousand dollar house it would cost you $500,000. But what you can do is you can call the bank and say, hey, bank, I'm going to want to buy this house. I'll give 20%. Can you give me 80%? They say, sure thing. They're like, you bring $100,000, we'll bring the other $400,000. So the same $100,000 can buy a $500,000 asset in real estate. But if you're investing in stocks, you can only buy $100,000. So what happens if both of these go up by 5%? Your house goes up in value by 5% and, and the Coca-Cola share goes up by 5%. See, if it goes up 5% on Coca-Cola, you get 5% on $100,000. If it goes up 5% on your house, it's 5% of $500,000. You just 5X'd your returns. Five times the returns. And that's the power of leverage. Now, you do need to take something into, things into consideration. There is a cost to borrowing that money, so that will get taken off the top. But it is significantly more return if you were to leverage a mortgage as opposed to buying all cash. So that's one of the cool things about real estate investing. You don't necessarily have to buy all cash. You can leverage bank financing. You can leverage other people's money. And it is so incredibly valuable. So incredibly valuable. Absolutely. Okay. So 
The way to succeed in real estate investing. Oh, I just blasted through that. It's cash flow. He says, <laughs> no suspense whatsoever. It's like, <laughs> we're on, we're yeah. on a tight timeline today. <laughs> cash Sorry. flow. Yeah, you're absolutely yeah. right. Cash flow. Cash Why flow is, is how we succeed in real estate because it's a risk mitigator. So if we. Oh, yeah, can everybody just uh, maybe just slow the heck down? So everybody yeah. can write that down because that is one of the most important things we're going to be talking about today. Yeah. It's Cash flow is... is a risk mitigator. So when people decide that they want to invest in something, they want to take their hard earned cash and make it work for them. Um, it's scary because like Wayne was just showing you, stocks can go up and go down and real estate can go up and go, can go down. Markets change, all those things. So people, people get worried. They get scared about their money, right? And they're they worried that like, what if the value of the property goes get down? Or what if I need to sell? What if, yeah. what if rents go down? What if interest rates go up? What if, what if, what if, what if, if you buy a, a piece of real estate and and we're not by the way we're not sitting on a piece of real estate like we're sitting on a piece of share of coca-cola we're buying a rental property we're buying an asset that an income producing asset so it's not just an asset that goes up and down in value we're actually we're going to utilize this as an income producing asset which is someone is going to rent this property as their home and provide us the rent for that and that rent is going to go towards our mortgage payments our property taxes our insurance it's going to cover all of our expenses and then what we're trying to do what is cash flow cash flow is the excess is the extra money after we've taken the rent and we paid all of those expenses mortgage property taxes hoa fees condo fees insurance whatever we put some money toward uh, aside as well there's uh, with that extra little money that difference there is what's called cash flow and that's a cushion and that cushion is what prevents us from all those potential what ifs. What if the mm -hmm. rents go down? What if the interest rates go up and the mortgage payments go up? What if yeah. a tenant doesn't uh, doesn't pay on time? Right. That cash flow is that buffer that a lot that that is that risk mitigator that covers us in the event that something happens. That cash yeah. flow can be used and be put into a reserve fund to prevent um, you know, the possibility of, of you know, a tenant not paying rent, at least we got some money set aside, right? What if our property taxes go up? No big deal. We've got a good cash flow buffer. Property taxes go up, not a big deal. Still got cash flow, baby. What if, insur what if insurance rates go up? Not a problem, still got cash flow. What if rents go down? Not a problem, still got cash flow. What if interest rates jump from 3% to 7% in, in 12 months? <laughs> Not a problem. <laughs> Not a problem. We're good. Yeah. <laughs> now, what if you started with no cash flow or a little bit of cash flow? You're going to be down here. Not a whole lot of room there, baby. Yeah. There's not a whole lot of room. Anything happens. That's when the pressure starts to build up. That's when people are getting a little desperate. And we're just talking about one property right now. What if you had five? What if it went like this and you start owing money every month? You own $200 every month is negative cash flow that you need to pull out of your pocket every month and put into that property to cover those expenses. And you own five properties. It's $1,000 a month. Do you make enough money in your job to be able to cover that? Cash flow is a risk mitigator. Cash flow covers you for this. No matter what happens in the market, as long as you've got a cushion to protect you to weather the storm, guess what? If the property value goes from 500,000 down to 350, as long as you don't sell, you can wait for the value of that to go back up again. Now, it doesn't ever really go down that low. We've only seen it ever drop 10% in the last 20 years. But if the value of the property goes down and you can't make those payments and you have a negative cash flow situation, you are forced to sell, then yes, you are going to lose because you bought it for 500, you sold it for 400. Yeah, there's a hundred thousand dollar loss there. But as long as you have good cash flow and, and you can weather that storm, that risk mitigator that protects you, then you're okay. Just don't sell. Just wait for the value of the property to go back up and up again, right? Because historically, over time, over the last hundred years, I believe, historically, real estate has always gone up. The average per year is like three point something percent over the last hundred years. It always goes up. It will go down from time to time. It does go like this. But it always historically has gone up in an upwards trend because they're not making any more of it, right, Mr. Twain? Right? So invest for cash flow, and that is how you succeed in real estate investing. That is your risk mitigator, okay? Mm. And you so got to treat also, it like a business. You also this need to treat it like... not something that you just do for, for fun. Yeah. 
So these treating it like a business is also all these points that we're going to go through are also risk mitigators. Yes. So making sure that we're buying in the good location and that we're getting the good product with the good clients and the good tenant profile and all these things are ensuring that our that we're mitigating our risk that we're not buying a bad investment where we're going to have bad tenants because we chose a bad location and a crappy product that's attracting lower class tenants that aren't taking care of our properties. So all these things that we do to treat it like a business are also risk mitigators. Yes. So that location that we talked about is, you know, the difference between buying, you know, um buying I don't know on think of Think of the worst neighborhood in your city, wherever yeah. you're tuning in from. We've always, every city's got that bad neighborhood you're not supposed yeah. to invest in. Yeah. And if you buy something there, what kind of tenants do you think that you're going to attract? And what kind of product do you think you're going to find? I mean, maybe you placed a, you know, a brand new build on that land. Maybe you tore it down and put something new there thinking, oh, okay, well, you know, it's not the best location, but I got a good product. <laughs> yeah. You're still, you might, you might get a mediocre kind of tenant profile, but they're not going to want to stay because that location. You still have all the other houses surrounding you are all crummy and all attracting the bad tenants. So they're not going to want to stay. So all these things that we put into treating it like a business all come together in unison and make sure that we're mitigating our risks and that we have a really great cash flowing property. Just like, so, any, just like any other um, business, you know, McDonald's, they're always buying the, the, they're always putting their locations in one of the best possible areas, right? Because you want to get as many good clients as possible. You want to have a huge demand. And obviously, you want to have a good product as well, right? Absolutely. Now, maybe maybe we'll get into like the financing side of treating it like a business. Um, like any good business, I'm pretty sure that they always have a bank account that's got some extra cash in it. Right? They always got a kitty. They always got a reserve fund because something's always going to happen, right? Especially when you own a piece of real estate too. There will be um, long-term maintenance. There will be short maintenance. There will be repairs. There will be things that are outside of your control. And you need to have cash in the bank in a reserve fund in order to cover that when it happens, right? So you need to have good cash flow to make sure, and obviously your business has to have good cash flow in order to replenish that reserve fund and make sure you always have a healthy reserve fund that you can pull out of and then make sure it always replenishes so that you never have to put any of your own money into it, right? You want your tenants to pay the rent to replenish it. And that comes from cash flow, like we talked about earlier. And obviously, you know, a good business has good liquidity, right? You always need to have access to capital. And whether that be through access on a home equity line of credits on your property, or that be access through uh, capital, you know, in your bank account and your reserve fund, just having make sure you have lots of liquidity. So then when things happen, you're always able to pull it and you're not pulling it from here. Okay. Basic Absolutely. business fundamentals. Yeah, and we'll get into the mathematics behind it when we go through, you know, running the math on on how a rental property works. You'll see, um, you know, how we take out a certain percentage for repairs and maintenance and a certain percentage to cover vacancies and those types of things. So um, that having that good cash flow allows us to take that money aside and keep building on that reserve fund, or let's call it that foundation that's really holding that property in its entirety together to be a good sound business structure okay let's get into it you want to get awesome. into the numbers let's get into the numbers so we want to go over you know how the numbers work on a rental property and um, how you can run the basic math um, to make sure that you find a cash flowing property and um i i like that so this this was kind of like an old example that um we used to use and these were you know numbers from one of our um one of our suite of properties that we self managed yep. and um i love i love that we kept it here unchanged because we know numbers have changed we know interest rates have gone up we know rents have gone up we know that um insurance has gone up property taxes has gone up utilities have gone up literally everything is increasing so it's only a few years. Yeah. And so these numbers, um, you might be looking at them and going like, uh, and also keep in mind, this is in Edmonton. So if any of you are out of province and thinking like, what the heck is this? These, these are some very realistic, basic numbers that we had a couple of years ago. Yeah. And, but what I love is that, you know, we're going to go through them and we can see the cash flow and we can also tell you that um, because we mitigated our risks and we bought for cash flow and we had our healthy reserve fund and everything in place, that this property is doing just fine today, you guys. 
Okay. <laughs> so it didn't sink us. It didn't, you know, any of that. So I think it goes to show that when you buy right, even though these numbers are going to go all out of whack, when things happen, when the storms come in, we, we still just cruising along. Right. Yeah. And the rents have gone up on that property as well. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Everything. So yeah. But kind of had we financed that incorrectly, had we not had a reserve funding or had we have had we financed that incorrectly and it hadn't had that cash flow, maybe it was only a hundred dollars. I think we'd be in a, a pretty rough shape. Different situation. Right. Yeah. And and that's only one property. If you've got a portfolio of over 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 doors, that adds up. And I've heard so many stories about people back in the 2000s when 2007, 2008 came and suddenly the rents went down and everything changed. There were a lot of people who so had had to sell, right? So yes. make sure that you got a good cash flowing property. Again, guys, this is why this is, this is, this is how you, how you win the game long-term. Absolutely. So when you look at the numbers on a rental property, if you're looking to buy a house in this example, we have a suited house that's self-managed. Um, so first of all, what you want to do is you want to look at what the potential rents are going to be for that property. So, um, you know, hopefully you have some good experts on your team, but also you can do some uh, market uh, research to see what similar types of properties are currently on the market are renting for. So you can search things like Facebook Marketplace, um, Kijiji, Craigslist, um, RentFaster, all those sites that um, where people would post their rental listings. So you can do some market research of your own, figure out how much rent can I realistically collect for this place? And then you kind of work your way back. You say, what are all my expenses going to be? So if I purchase, you know, I know what my what my um, mortgage payments are going to be because we've already run the mortgage calculator and, and know how much I'm going to have to put down and what the payments are going to be. So you start subtracting from that rent. So you take out your mortgage payment, you take out your property taxes, which you should also be able to obtain. Um, if you're buying on market, then you have your MLS highlight sheet and they need to give you the previous year's um, property tax amount. So you can get that number from there. Um, then you also subtract your insurance costs. So um, insurance, uh, typically people don't go and get insurance quotes while they're in the kind of like house hunting stage. But you can, again, ask some ex experts, ask in the community how much insurance would be for a typical um, property that you're looking at and get that number. Yeah. Um, utilities, some of you might be laughing because utilities aren't that, aren't that cheap anymore <laughs> for a suited property. Um, but you can also ask in the community, find out what the going rate for a suited property is for utilities, uh, your kind of average, average monthly costs. And then you factor in your um, vacancy and your repairs and maintenance. So these two costs are based off of the amount of rent that you're bringing in. So as you can see, vacancy is 8% and repairs and maintenance is 4%. Those numbers come off of the 3,200 that we're collecting in rent. Do you mind if I explain um, um, what I vacancy about to ask refers? If you would kind of dive into those a bit, for sure. So the reason why, oh, let me explain first what a vacancy is. So um, when you have tenant turnover, or any time that the any time that the unit is empty, whether that be for repairs, whether that be for tenant turnover, maybe you have someone moving out and you don't have someone moving in right away, and then therefore you you will be advertising for the first of the following month. You got 30 days, 31 days of that thing sitting empty, and that comes at a cost to you. Um, if you evict someone, um, which doesn't happen very often, but if you do evict someone, same thing. You're going to remove them, and it's going to be sitting empty until you find a replacement. Um, that comes at a cost to you and normally comes out of your... Um, your reserve fund, right? And that can have a very dramatic effect on your reserve fund. We were talking earlier about like a hot water tank being 2000 bucks. If, if you're full, well, this is, this has two suites, but if you were a single family house and the rent was $2,000, that's $2,000 you don't have coming in, right? And that comes at a cost. So the reason why we choose 8% is a very, very simple um, kind of, um, creative uh, reason. And that's because if you take 8% of your rent every month for 12 months, what's eight times 12? 96. 96, which is 96% of a rent payment. So at the end of the year or at the end of every one year lease, you assume because you're signing one year leases more often than not, one year fixed leases with your tenants. If you assume at the end of their one year lease, they decide that they don't want to stay and they leave 
and you got to do a little bit of cleanup or, or maybe some touch-ups and stuff like that, or maybe you don't have someone lined up for the same day when they leave, someone else is moving in, then you're going to normally have one month of vacancy. So if you allocate or you take out a section of your rent and put it in there, assuming that at the end of every one-year lease, there's going to be a one-month vacancy, you've already got that money allocated for it, right? Now, more often than not, tenants will just stay and they'll, and they'll renew, right? With a new lease, or maybe you'll have a new tenant moving in. But we always want to plan for that because that's a huge expenditure that can really affect your reserve fund over time. And uh, we just want to make sure, again, we always have a good, nice, healthy, replenished reserve fund. Now, repairs and maintenance, um, we put 4% here. That will range from 2% all the way up to 8%. If you're dealing with multifamily buildings, you have so much more in maintenance that is required. You could have grass cutting, snow removal, um, security, um, cleaning in the common areas and stuff like that. So it could be significantly higher. Um, I would say 2% would be the lowest. And that's normally for like a brand new built turnkey property that has warranty for the next five years, that has brand new appliances, brand new furnace, brand new hot water tank, brand new everything. So you don't really need to set aside all that much for those for those uh, repairs and maintenance and replacements because everything is brand new. If you're buying a property that's 20 years old, okay, you got a furnace that's that's just about to die. You've got a, uh, you're on your second hot water tank. Uh, the roof shingles are starting to curl. The windows are getting a little bit older. The appliances have probably already been replaced and need to be replaced again. There's a lot of long-term deferred maintenance and repairs that needs to be done. So you kind of have to gauge it based on your asset that you're buying. And when you are buying that property, take into consideration everything inside, every single piece, every single moving piece, replaceable piece, and think about, okay, cool. What needs to be replaced in the next 10 years? How can I strategically make sure that I'm allocating some of my cash flow towards going into the reserve fund to make sure that I have I have that money there, right? It, I, I've made, I, I'm going deep already, but I've made recommendations or I make recommendations to the people that we coach to always have like a huge list of everything and put when it was installed, when it needs to be replaced and then reverse engineer it and have a calculation of how much money over the next 10 years you're going to be spending on repairs and maintenance and then like normal repairs, like toilet repairs and that kind of stuff um broken uh, handles and whatnot um make sure that you have like if i assume that over the next 15 years i know guaranteed or sorry the next 10 years and i know guaranteed i have fifteen thousand dollars worth of things that need to be replaced i want to make sure that i'm i'm getting at least fifteen thousand dollars for repairs and maintenance and then a little bit more for other unexpected costs so we always have a good healthy reserve fund so think about that when you're buying properties as well okay you might have a really good deal, but you might have $30,000 worth of things that need to be replaced in the next five years, which comes at a cost to you, which might affect your cash flow because you need to set money aside for that. Yeah. And um, also before we move off of this slide, I also just wanted to quickly um, just mention so that there's no confusion, um, as I know that there are some, um, a lot of newer people in here, is that in this example, this is a suited house where... Um, basically like with utilities. So in these rent prices, um, there's like a flat fee ut utility charge for each suite that's included in the rent. And that's because there aren't separate meters. So there aren't separate utility bills for each suite. And we don't want our tenants communicating and sharing a bill and trying to split it. It gets really messy. You don't want your tenants dealing with each other too much. Yeah. It just opens up the door for problems. So in this case, because there's shared utility bill we include the rent, we pay it, and we charge them a flat fee, which is basically the average of, of the utility bills over the year, um, and then broken down to monthly. So in this case, that's why we have the rent is higher, it includes the utilities, and then we subtract our average monthly utilities when we're trying to do the calculation to get our cash flow. Yeah. But if it was a single um, family home, and there was just one, one suite, one tenant, absolutely, they would take care of their own utilities, set up their own account and pay it, and we would have nothing to do with it. But in this case, I wanted to explain that's why we have utilities subtracted. Yeah. And that and then the, the rents are higher because it includes the flat fee that we're charging. I'm going to be struggling today because I always want to provide as much value as possible. I'm going to go through it real fast, super fast. $1,700. Yeah, that's actually $1,400 of rent and $300 worth of utilities, okay? $1,300 downstairs is actually $1,100 rent and $200 utilities. And then we have $200 for garage, whichever tenant decides that they want to get the garage, normally upstairs. Um, so if 
we're collecting 300 from upstairs for utilities and 200 downstairs from utilities. That's 500. Our actual cost of utilities is only 400. It means that there's a little extra cash flow there, 100 bucks. Now, there, I highly recommend this to everyone. If you have a house where you are collecting utilities and you are collecting a flat, so you're paying for utilities and you're collecting a flat rate from your tenants, uh, make sure you always collect a little bit more because- a buffer. It's, Sorry? A buffer. A buffer, yes. Because you never know- cold winter months, depending on wh where, where you live in Canada, um, can have significantly higher natural gas costs because they're heating the house. Whereas in the summer, there's no natural gas because everybody's got their windows open trying to cool off. Um, but a little bit higher in electricity um, in certain months, oh, well, in the winter, higher electricity because the lights are on longer, right? So in the winter months, they tend to be a little bit more in the summer months, they tend to be less. So what you do is you take a weighted average, and um, uh, a, a, a weighted average of the, all the 12 months, add them all up, every bill, divide it by 12, and that will tell you what the average is for the year, and then a little a bit more on there. So from time to time, sometimes someone leaves a tap on or something like that, or there's a leaking faucet, a toilet that's running a little bit longer. You'll have months where there's an extra 300 bucks, and you're like, oh, I didn't collect for that. And you can't collect from the tenants without getting too complicated. So make sure you always have a buffer to make sure you are never paying more in utilities than your tenants are, are using. Yes. So that buffer again, risk mitigator, how to yep. succeed in real estate. <laughs> these are little, these are little hot tips that you pick up over time. Right. And you, I, I hope you guys are writing these down because these are, these are hot tips to apply to your business to make sure we've, we've, we've learned these lessons or, or our, our previous coaches or mentors have learned these lessons and they shared them, passed them down. Um, so this way you build a business where you've got risk mitigators everywhere. So you never get surprised. That reserve fund, these, this little tip about the utilities and stuff like that is so that we never get surprised. I want this thing to be completely self-sufficient and automated. Absolutely. Okay. So we've showed everybody how the numbers work. So, you know, they've gone, they've researched, they've maybe found a property. So let's go over, um, how do you buy a rental property? And really, you know, it's, it's, a lot like buying your own home, but instead of buying it for yourself, you're buying a business. So as we said earlier, you need to treat it like a business because you are, this property is a business. So these are the steps that you would follow. Um, Wayne, do you want me to go through these and you can just add where, where you want to yeah. add in? I'm just looking okay. at, I'm just looking at how we're doing for time. That's all. Okay. Uh, uh, we're doing did, you talk, did, you, keeping... did you talk about lunch? Break. No, I didn't. So uh, we're not quite sure how, where the timing will land, but we're hoping around noon to take a half hour lunch break. Yeah. So um, we'll see exactly where it lines up, but there will be a break in here. Yeah. Okay. okay, so steps to buy a rental property. So first, very first, very, very, very first thing that you want to do is determine your financial approval. So don't go looking at houses, assuming you can qualify for any certain amount of property or any property, certain property type without talking to a mortgage broker first. Um, because I promise you, the, the mortgage industry changes so fast, the rules change so fast every single day. And what you thought you could or what you qualified for a couple months ago or a couple years ago or, or whatever it may be, isn't the same today. So you need to know today, if you are ready to go buy a rental property, you need to know today what you can qualify for. So that's always your number one step. Don't go waste a whole bunch of time and waste a realtor's time showing you properties and researching a type of property that you're not going to qualify for. You want to first determine your financing approval. So step number one, get in contact with a real estate investor-focused mortgage broker who can help you do that, okay? Step number two, choose an investment location. So you need to do your your research on the markets and um, different cities across Canada. Are you going to be, you know, investing in your backyard or across the country? Um, you really need to nail down what location you're going to be investing in. But um, even, you know, more dialed in than that is like, where in the city are you going to be investing? So you really need to like, nail down where you're going to be focused in on and so that you're not looking at this like wide array because the numbers are going to change the tenant profile is going to change the desirability is going to change in every neighborhood in every city in every in every market rents, so you need to, rents are going to be different yeah so you need to nail that down you need to choose the investment location next is select, selecting the property type 
So as I just said, you know, there's, there's going to be lots of different types of properties and the different properties are going to have different price points. So, you know, based within what you can get approved for, you're also going to be selecting what type of property falls under that. So, you know, if it's a lower amount, you might be looking at townhouses versus, um, you know, if you can qualify for something higher, you might be looking at single family houses um, or duplexes and that sort of thing, suited properties, and then you can get into kind of like multifamily and that sort of stuff as well. But um, you need to know what type of property. And if I can just offer a piece of advice is to really um, get focused. So don't just, you know, willy nilly say like, oh, you know, if a, if a townhouse makes sense, I'll get a townhouse. If a single family house pops up and, you know, it makes sense, I'll get that. Like really focus in on the investment types that are going to support your future and your goals and focus on those. Don't get distracted by the shiny object or, you know, the, you might be on like a hundred different realtors mailing lists and somebody sends you something that's like, Ooh, this looks interesting. Let's check this out. Try to stay focused once you select that property. Ooh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> Begin with the end in mind. Why are you doing it? What are you doing this for? How, every decision that you make should be, will it get me closer to that? Yep. Right? Absolutely. Now, I'm going to make an argument. I think you should have reversed the uh, the arrangement of this, the order. Because me personally, I think, I'm not arguing with you, I'm just saying just the order. Uh, I think, Gabby, you agree with this as well. I think you should choose your tenant profile first. It's kind of hard. Like, when you're trying to figure out, okay, I, I want to, I want $5 million uh, by the time I'm, I want to be worth $5 million by the time I'm 45. Um, first thing I need to do is figure out who do I want to rent to? <laughs> That's, it doesn't, doesn't really make all that much sense. But, but truthfully, when you're buying a property, you kind of have to think of your client first. Who's gonna, who is going to want to um, pay for this property? Who is going to want to live here? That's your client, right? And if you're going to buy a property because uh, you think it's a really good deal in a new development um, but all of your your tenant pool can't afford it, then then you just bought a property that nobody wants to rent, right? So you kind of have to think about who is the type of tenant that I want first. Me personally, I'll give you I'll give you my my perf my perfect tenant profile. I like the person who makes uh, an average um, wage, who's kind of peaked at where they're going to go in their career. Um, because I, I like that type of person because maybe, maybe they make $70,000 a year, $120,000 a year, you know, total, um, family income. I want them to stay as long as possible. That's what I'm looking for. So if I got someone who's like a first year apprentice and I know they're going to be getting a huge rate increase or, or a wage increase in the next four years, then once they get that $20 increase, are they going to still want to rent this anymore? No, they're going to probably want to move and get into something bigger. I don't want them to move because when they move, there's the likelihood or the risk that I'm going to have a vacancy. And that vacancy, as I explained earlier, comes at a high cost to me, which is going to affect my bottom line. So I want someone who's not going to move, who's just going to sit there for 10 years. Because when they sit there for 10 years, that's 10 years worth of vacancies right? $2,000 a year times 10 years is $20,000, right? I'm exposing myself to $20,000 with a risk. So I like people who are kind of like right where they're going to be for the next 20 years. They're, nothing's really going to change. They like the area because their kids go there to the school there. You know what I mean? Like they're not going to up and move. I That's the tenant profile I'm looking for. Not a specific type of person where like, I want a person that doesn't smoke or I want a person that does this type of stuff. I just want someone who's not going to change their mind in the next 10 years. And I want them to stay a long time and I want to treat them like gold and for them to treat us like gold. So thinking like that, where is the largest um, pool or what, what's the, uh, of my tenant pool, where's, what type of people are looking for something like that and what price range? And in, so if I'm thinking, okay, that they can only afford $1,600 a month. That's where they're going to be. I need to find a rental property asset type that's going to accommodate that type of person. Is buying a $600,000 single family house in a new development the right move? Probably not. Is buying a $190,000 townhouse where the rent is $1,600 perfect? Yes. You know what I mean? Because that kind of supports the $1,600 a month supports the, the $190,000 asset. I can go back to our, our numbers earlier. I can look at the mortgage payments, property taxes, kind of fees, everything else. It's a good cash flowing property. So start with your client, reverse engineer it, find the right property type for them that cash flows. 
in the right area where they want to live. Is buying an acreage outside of the city going to support? Is, is that where they want to live? No. Is buying a, a condo downtown where they want to be with their three kids? No. So you kind of have to think about which areas are these types of um, these types of people looking for. And I want to make sure, again, that I have a huge pool of people to choose from because I want high demand. I want those tenants to demand this type of asset. So I want to provide them with the service and the product that they are looking for. So you kind of have to start with the tenant in mind first or the client in mind first. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so once you have that all figured out, who your tenant profile is, where they want to be living, so finding your location and you know what type of property type they fit into, um, as well as that uh, financing approval, um, that's when you can start to um, start to search for properties with your realtor. So you can contact your investor-focused realtor. You can get set up on a search based on all of those things. So you can tell them, I'm interested in these neighborhoods, these types of properties with, you know, three bedrooms, uh, you know, uh, whatever backyard, blah, blah, blah. Insert whatever things are important to that tenant that you want to make sure you have in your property. And they'll set you up on a search and you'll start getting emails each time those properties come available on the market. You're going to get notified and you're going to say, hey, Mr. and Mrs. Realtor, take me to see that property, please. And you can start your search. Pretty so simple. When, when yeah, you know pretty, what it is that you want, you just tell people to put it out there in the world. Hey, this is what I'm looking for. And yeah. then just wait. Yeah, I really think that there's um, too many people in the real estate investing community today that are just on so many lists of people pumping out properties. And it's such a distraction of like this opportunity, this opportunity, check out this tear down and, oh, but did you see this cash flowing duplex? And, oh, next thing we have on the list is a- Airbnb, $4,000 a month in cash flow. Yeah, it's it's really distracting. And really the only search that you should be on, unless you're like, unless you're looking for distressed properties and that's it, and you're like flipping them. And so you're on a whole bunch of lists to, to try to see like, who's going to find the next distressed property. Sure, if you can stay focused and not distracted by all the other stuff. But otherwise, if you are on the hunt for a certain property, get off those lists and stay focused within your search parameters. Yeah, put the blinders on. Don't get rid of all those distractions and, and stay focused on those fundamentals, the basics, the risk mitigators, and get that property that fits your parameters that you've set. So once you find that property, you're going to make a conditional offer. So... Um, a conditional offer means that you're going in and saying, hey, I really like this property. It fits all my criteria. It looks great. I really want to buy it. Here's the price that I think it's worth and that I'll offer to you. But if you accept my offer, I just need to make sure that my bank says, yep, this is okay. We will finance you. And also I need want to get an inspection done to for an inspector to come in and say, yeah, this place is sound. You're not going to have any problems, or maybe you are going to have some problems. So here's how we can fix them and gives you some, some recommendations. So the conditions really give you the opportunity to get that accepted offer and, and get committed to that property, but for then you to make sure that you're good to go. So it still gives you an opportunity to get out if a situation presents itself that you're not willing to take on, like you're either your, um, your mortgage lender says, nope, we're not going to approve you for that. We don't like this property or something's changed in your financing history that we don't like. Maybe you went and financed a brand new Ford F-150 and they're like, <laughs> shouldn't have done that. See ya. Where's the mortgage or, brokers today? They're probably laughing. Yeah. <laughs> or maybe, you know, the inspection showed some like significant cracks and, you know, this is supposed to be turnkey. You're not ready to go in and, and do any major repairs. And so you're like, oh, whoa, okay wasn't prepared for that. This doesn't work for me. So it allows you to get out of the property, out of the offer without, you know, um, any legal recourse. So that's what a conditional offer means. If you were to go in unconditional, you're saying, hey, here's the amount of money I'm willing to offer you. I'm, I'm covered. I don't care what's going on in the property. I don't care. I got my financing. We're good. If you accept it, here's a closing date. Let's go. So you don't, if you try to back out at that point, after they accept it, you have legal repercussions at that point. Yeah. So those conditions really, um, again, 
risk mitigator. Yeah. I like those are going to be my two words of the day. <laughs> <laughs> risk okay. mitigation. So it's all about. Yeah. That's how we're going to do it. CEO. Thing. Being a good CEO. Yeah. We too, see too many people make mistakes and get burned. So this is why we're going back to the basics today about how to make a solid sound business that has all the risk mitigators in place and you're going to play safe and you're going to build a beautiful long-term future for yourself. Yeah. Wealthy future for yourself. Okay. Wealthy. Yeah. Yeah. So after you complete that due diligence, you're going to remove the conditions. So those conditions that we mentioned, uh, you know, the financing, the inspection, whatever conditions you put in place, if all of those have been met and you're good to go, then your realtor is going to say, hey, other person's realtor, we're good. We're removing these conditions. We're good to go. Congrats. We're buying the house. Okay. Um, so once those are removed, that's when everything gets sent off to the mortgage broker and the lawyers and they start processing things on their end, making sure that the mortgage funds are sent to the lawyers to do their little swap of funds and swap of title and all that kind of stuff. So they get busy on the back end. Um, something that we didn't put in here, but like at that point, that's when you're going to go and make sure you get your insurance in place and that you, if you need a new bank account set up, you're all ready to go so that you can give them, you know, the bank account that your money's going to come out of. So you you get to get to work as well in the background while the while the mortgage specialist and the broke and the lawyer are doing their thing. May I ask? And, yeah. Um. Before before we we you know we finish this off here, I just I want to add that we're we didn't bring we didn't add this to the uh, to the presentation today uh, for this boot camp. Uh, we didn't talk about the power team at all. And through all of these steps, it's so incredibly important to have a power team of reliable professionals who deal with real estate investor. You probably, you may have heard this before, maybe you haven't heard this before, but the term investor focused, it kind of gets thrown around a little loosely now because it's such a, like a common cliche thing, but you want to make sure that the people on your team, you know, your home inspector, your realtor, your mortgage broker, your lawyer, your handyman if required, they, they, they deal with real estate investors on a daily basis. Right, because they understand how this whole thing works for you as a real estate investor. Gabby, you put it up there. It's a lot like buying a home, but it's a little bit different. And you can't use the same, you can't, you can, but it won't work nearly as well if you use the same people that you use when you bought your home because they just don't understand real estate investors. It's not the same. So make sure that your power team for your real estate investing business is investor focused. They deal with real estate investors every day and it's going to help move this process along so much smoother, so much smoother, right? Because they deal with us like on a daily basis. Um, these two weeks here from looking at the property, writing the offer, conditions period of two weeks, removing conditions and then closing on it in whatever, two weeks after that or a month after that is incredibly stressful because you have all of these moving pieces and you've got timelines and nobody seems to be treating this like it, like it's their own. You know what I mean? It just seems like, oh, I'm waiting. I'm waiting. They're supposed to get back to me today. They didn't get back to me. It's extremely stressful because you have a lot of moving pieces and people waiting on things. So make sure that you build a team that you can rely on that are, that are dependable and that are responsible. And that also you can communicate with very well. I wanted to add that in there because it's extremely yeah. important. Yeah, and I'm glad you did. And I'll just, since since we're here, I'll just highlight a couple of things that could maybe go wrong is that, you know, if you don't have a um, investor focused mortgage broker, you might end up with a mortgage product that um, isn't best suited for what you're, what you're trying to accomplish. Or your long-term goals. Say, yeah, or your long-term goals. Say you're, you know, doing um, renovations and then you want to be able to refinance it, but the mortgage broker didn't understand that and they put you in a fixed term, fixed five-year term because it had the lowest interest rate and, um, you know, you got the best deal, but then you're trying to refinance and realize that you have this huge mortgage penalty. So all of a sudden all your money's tied up in it. That's something that could go wrong if they didn't understand what you were trying to do as an investor. Um, or if you picked the wrong uh, realtor that wasn't investor focused and, you know, maybe you were looking at a a suited property and um, they said, oh yeah, it's good. Look at this secondary suite in the basement here. Look at how solid this looks. Oh, this is going to do huge cash flow. They told me that they're bringing in this much in rent and yada, yada, yada. And you're like, sweet cash flow, baby. They said to invest for cash flow. This thing's just bringing it in cash cow. And then you buy it and you learn that it's not a legal suite. 
and that, you know, if you want to be doing things above water, yeah. that you have some major money you got to dump into this thing to get it up to, to today's standard. And so these are the types of things that can go wrong when you just say like, hey, my, you know, cousin Joe is a, a realtor, help me buy my first house. So he's, but he's helped all my family. We've all used him. He's great. But he doesn't understand investing. And that's where we run into a lot of issues. And if you talk to anybody who's invested for any decent amount of time, 5, 10, 20 years, they're all going to tell you, almost all of them are going to tell you that um, one of, some of their biggest mistakes were not having the right people on their team, the right investor-focused people on their team. And that's where some of the biggest, most expensive mistakes came in. So um, we really try to preach that. And I'm really glad that you brought it up because you're right. We haven't um, we haven't put anything specific in here about building your team. So um, yeah, it's a good good little thing to slip in. It's so hard because we have so much to share and to teach. And this is why I said I'm going to have trouble this weekend because I when I say things, I'm like, oh, I can add 10 other it depends that you should be considering. I don't like giving basic information. I don't because I feel that basic information will get people in trouble. And that's what happens. People will come into events like this and please don't be that person. Please don't be the person that just finishes this weekend after, you know, five hours worth of education. You're like, I'm a sophisticated real estate investor now. I'm going to go do whatever I want and raise money. And, and, but because they taught me, but like, we haven't, we haven't taught you everything and there's so much more to it. And there's, so, you have to invest in yourself and you have to take courses. You have to get a coach. You have to learn you, there, and you have to get experience. So I, I this is very hard for us. Cause like, I'm like, Oh shit, we got to tell them about the, uh, we got to tell them about the power team. And I'm like, because they're going to use their same, you know, mortgage broker they used before. They're not going to get going to get the right mortgage uh, product. Um, just be aware that after this weekend, more education is required. I see so many people here actually that have been in the game for a few years now, and they're still getting educated, even though this is you know entry level stuff. They're still here. They're still learning more, which I I applaud you for being here. Um, now, one last thing before you move on, uh, I see someone asking about: Do you have to use a realtor? Um, just be patient. We're going to be getting into that after we talk about um, uh, uh, analyzing markets. Um, and we'll be getting into different ways to find deals. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. And also just to note that we do have, um, it looks like some investor focused um, people in here with us today in the chat. And so I'm just going to say it again, Wayne said it at the beginning, but you guys um, use this opportunity to introduce yourselves in the chat. And I see the the chat's going crazy. You guys are um, asking questions and answering questions and and connecting. So continue to do that. Use this opportunity to network and and um, tell people who you are and how you can help and all that kind of stuff. Connect. Yeah. yeah, we have we also have some of our mentees in our mentorship program here as well, and I see them answering questions. Thank you so much. I'm trying not to just be sitting over here typing and answering stuff. So thank you guys to the REM Masters mentees that are being helpful in the in the chat as well. Obviously, you guys have a lot of um, value to to offer, and we appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so um, next, uh, you're going to go into the lawyer and you're going to be signing your mortgage and legal documents. And basically, when that is done, usually it's done really close to the possession date. Like a week oh, before. I see this, yeah, I see the sun's coming out and I'm like washing out. Sorry. <laughs> I told you it was going to happen. <laughs> it looks like Gabby's like going up to heaven. Yeah. Just like, yeah. <laughs> Don't worry, guys. I knew that was going to happen to you. <laughs> she wanted that sunlight on her, but like yeah. she didn't, there's no curtain there. That's okay. Yeah. That's okay. Um, so usually signing those documents happen um, within a day or two before your possession date. So it's usually pretty quick. You go in, you sign the documents, and then usually a day or two later, they send you an email saying, hey, we're good. You got the funds transferred. Um, you can Your realtor will meet you to get the keys and congrats. Yeah. You purchased a rental property. Yeah. <laughs> woo -woo. Yeah. Pretty yeah. exciting. It's always yeah, fun it's, to get you get to enjoy it for about a split second and then you get right into filling vacancies and then you're right on to getting the next property. It's one thing too is um, we, I think it's important when you when you get those keys, go out and celebrate. If you guys have been following me on social and me and Gabby for a while, and we, we, we have our little routines or our little, um, what do you call them, uh, traditions for when for when we get a win or when we buy a property. Uh, sometimes we go out for tacos. We call them tacos and transactions. Um, when we transact, you know, it's just to make sure that you're, you're finding some way to celebrate your wins because they do, they really do. As you become more successful, they're going to come and they're going to go and then you're on to the next thing. And so it's really important to slow down and really appreciate and, um, pat yourself on the back 
uh, for what you did, because those, those, those 30 to 45 days can be extremely stressful for it. How many of you guys have actually uh, posted in the, in the comments, how many of you guys have ever bought a property and, and you, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> it's There's always something stressful. that goes wrong too, last minute, like with the never market. Never a perfect closing, ever, <laughs> ever. There's never in the history we had. I think we had one. We've never had maybe, maybe one. <laughs> yeah, like something always happens, and yeah. it's so stressful. Yeah. Um. So make sure at the and end that, of it, that financing hustle is is a real man. <laughs> Insurance can be crazy. Yeah. Right. The all those things are all big hurdles that you need to overcome in order to finally get the property. And it's so easy for us to just be like, oh, okay, it's done. And then like carry on with life. But yeah, that's celebrating and um, acknowledging what you've done and um, how hard it was and that you overcame and persevered and congrats, you have your property, go, go celebrate. Yeah. Okay. So... That's how you buy the property. Yeah. Um, so we're going to get into some kind of fundamentals on, on analyzing markets. So, you know, we talked about choosing that location and and the property type and the tenant profile and all those types of things um, and how we can really dive into to, to making those decisions is by analyzing the market first. So you really need to dial into those fundamentals to know that you are buying in a sound area that makes sense, that supports your, Wayne said earlier, start with the end in mind. What what those what are those goals and what market is going to get me there, right? Okay. Analyzing markets. So this is a crucial step in making informed investment decisions. And um, we have kind of four key bullet points to consider um, when doing so, when analyzing those markets. So the first one is market demographics and trends. So we want to be able to research the local population demographics, including age, income levels, household size. And this really helps to identify the target market for your investment property. Um, you can analyze the population growth and migration trends to understand if um, the area, if we're seeing growth in the area or if we're seeing people moving away and it's declining. So all these are signs of what to expect in the housing market. If you have huge, if, if you know, if we like look at Alberta, for instance, we have huge immigration and interprovincial migration happening and that can plus a housing crisis. If anybody, you know, has been living in Iraq. Shortage. Yeah, huge shortage of, of housing for um, people buying and people renting. And so it, it shows us that all indications are pointing to a really great opportunity to own rental properties. There's going to be huge demand yeah, for a long time. And so it's like it's like those those signs are going off, the alarms are sounding, and it's it's a really good. But if you see a market where um, the population is declining and people are moving away and, and the populations are getting smaller, then you know that there's going to be more properties available, less people looking for rentals. There's going to be, you know, they're going to have lots of decisions, lots of um, properties to choose from. And isn't, there's not going to be that kind of um, immediate, like, I need a property, I need to, and that's where you get the high demand, right? Both of those examples you gave, both have opportunities. In investing, yes. You need to do. be able to really, really, you need to get really good at finding unique opportunities. Because I, I said earlier, it's like, and people are like, oh, it's scary. I don't know what to do. I, how do I know when it's good? And how do I know when it's bad? It's always good. You just have to be able to recognize the opportunities in every part of each cycle. Yes, Gabby's talking about huge interprovincial migration, migration, immigration into Canada. We have a shortage of properties, which is creating a huge um, housing crisis across Canada, across Canada, not just Alberta. But there's there's lots of people that want to come to Alberta because of the affordability. So what does that mean? It means we have lots of demand for rentals, meaning that there is a huge pool of people to choose from. It means that rents are going to go up. Demand means rents go up. Now, what happens to those properties when there's a shortage? There's a huge demand for, for buyers or investors are coming at it. When there's a huge demand and there's more buyers than there are uh, products to sell, houses to sell, means the value of the property is going to go up, multiple offer situations. So not only do we have rents go up, we got values go up. However you want to utilize that opportunity, do you want to buy a property and just see the value go up? 
Do you want to proper, buy a property, put it on some short-term financing, see the value go up, refinance it, pull your equity out? Do you want to do quick flips every two to three years? Do you want to do rent to owns? We haven't talked about that yet, but there's a huge opportunity for that in those in, in those um, uh, in that type of a market. Not to mention the fact that you just buy a property, rent it out, have good cash flow because the rents are going up and the value of that property is going up and you can just leave that equity there. Great opportunities there. Now, the other one where everybody's leaving and there's so much product on the market, what kind of opportunities are there? Well, if nobody's buying it, and there's, it's, it's a buyer's market because this, there's, there's too much product for the, the sellers, then you can get a really freaking good deal on that, right? If no one's buying, you get to choose the price. You get to make offers. And if people are desperate, they're going to they're gonna sell it to you for that price. Now, of course, you got to take a lot of other considerations into play. Do you want to be buying in a market where everything one's leaving? And yeah, you got a really good deal, but is there a demand for rentals? You got to think about that kind of stuff, right? But if you can see a unique opportunity to get a really good price and you know that things are going to come back around after something happens or in the near future, yeah, get a, get a really good deal on the buy, right? Get creative. Learn how to identify unique opportunities in every market and every, in every um, uh, part of the um, cycle. Cycle. Yeah. Ruined a really good point there by forgetting a five-letter word. <laughs> onwards gabby awesome okay next in analyzing markets is the economical factors so access the economic health of uh, sorry access assess the economic health of the area including unemployment rates job opportunities major employers a strong job market typically leads to higher demand for housing um so you you see Oh, I'm disappearing again. The heavens are taking me away. Um, <laughs> sorry, guys. Um, so we we see in the news a lot when um, you know the big employers decide to open big plants or to start big projects or those types of things. When you see those types of things in the news, or if you're doing your research and you see that there's all these projects planned or these new employers are opening shop in in your city or your province, those are all great indicators that there's going to be a strong job market and it's going to lead to higher demand for housing. So investigate the overall economic stability and growth prospects of the region as this can affect property values and rental income potential. Wayne, do you want to add anything to that or are we good? We're good. I'm just I'm yeah. trying to throttle it here, just trying to make sure we land right on 12 o'clock. Okay. <laughs> we got it here. Okay. I think we're good. Yeah. So, um, you know, uh, just, I guess I'll just kind of add a little thing to that is, you know, for, as an example is just like, again, because we're in Alberta, I'm going to speak to Alberta. Sorry if there's other people out of province here, but, um, like Edmonton, for instance, you know, we just got major news of, um, huge amounts of money going into, um, a plant here near Edmonton, um, to support the going, um, uh, zero emissions. So they're, they're, pumping billions of dollars into um, upgrading this plant and it's going to open enormous amount of jobs and money flowing into the economy here. And so those types of announcements are major. You should be watching for them. You should be paying attention to them and you should be following kind of what's going on when they're coming down the pipeline, all those types of things. I saw, um, I believe it was Shelly a little bit earlier. Uh, forgive me if, 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 if I, if I'm wrong, but I saw Shelly also said that um, the airport's doing, airport's doing an expansion as well. Yeah, that's all the um, renovations that uh, you said. That's what it's for. Yeah, lots of stuff going on at the airport. Interest. I didn't even know that. Yeah. <laughs> hey. I'm going to have to talk about that on the morning show on Monday. <laughs> okay, so number four. Did I skip over one? I'm just going to beep, boop, beep, boop. Yeah, I did. Okay. Um, so number three, real estate market analysis. So study property values, rental rates, price trends in the target area. Look for historical data and current listings to gauge the potential return on investment. Yeah. And um, evaluate the supply and demand dynamics for rental properties. An oversupplied market can lead to lower rental income and property values. Yeah, so, I'd say um, the last two years, uh, the last year to two years has been really good. Uh, in our market, but like for five years before that, I think we had a lot more supply 
it wasn't like an oversupply, but we had a lot more supply and, and we were getting a little creative during that cycle. And we were um, offering different types of incentives to get the right tenants, right? When, when, there's, when there's lots of product on the market and, and you're not getting as many applications and sometimes you have to get a little creative as to how you go about um, incentivizing someone to choose your product over, some, uh, over someone else's when there's lots that is similar, right? Um, so lowering the rent is, is normally lowering the price is normally the best way to get more attention and, um, uh, more people in the door, but sometimes you can get a little creative and you can offer, um, we were, we were looking at offering Xboxes, um, when it was, when it was hot, because, uh, we saw it as four or $500. Well, it might be better to offer four or $500 for that as an incentive, for the tenant profile that we were looking for for that basement suite, we wanted a young guy who plays Xbox. So it was like, it's a perfect incentive to attract the right type of person that we want. It's only $500. It's cheaper than us offering a month free worth of rent because the month free worth of rent would have been a thousand. So we saved a little bit of money there. We also, we attracted more people that are, um, that are like our tenant profile. So in an oversupplied market, you know, you got to get a little creative. Um, but when there's, when there's, um, when there's not as much supply like we've seen in in, in uh, recently in recent months um suddenly you can increase your rents a little bit more more people are applying and you get to pick and choose the best one or you can increase the rents and you can kind of test the market a little bit so again understanding the cycle and understanding unique opportunities um in different cycles um but you gotta you gotta be in the know you gotta understand things and you gotta know when the airport is expanding i didn't <laughs> I missed that one. Okay. Alrighty. Onwards, Gabby. Sorry, I just had to get off of mute. Yep. Okay. So, and the fourth one is regulatory and legal considerations. Mm. So understanding your local zoning regulations, building codes, landlord tenant laws, these factors can impact your ability to make modifications to the property and the obligations of the property owners. So um, also investigate property tax rates as they can significantly affect your operating expenses and overall profitability. Um, this is, I, I'd like, you know, since we're here, it's easy to say, I think this is the most important, but obviously they're all very important. But, we'll be saying um, it's the most important all weekend. Yeah. <laughs> But this is um, just something that's so important to understand. I think like if we really dial into what's blaringly kind of sticking out here is landlord tenant laws. Yeah. So, I, well, someone was talking about the comments there about um, different provinces and investing in different provinces yeah. than you live in. And um, someone brought up landlord tenant laws and they're so different in every province. Yeah, absolutely. So these are, yeah, really important factors to consider, especially if you're investing outside of your own province, because I mean, I hope that you know within your own province and your own city what your local zoning regulations are, the building codes, all that kind of stuff, as well as your landlord tenant laws. But when you start looking outside of your where you live, it becomes so important to understand all these factors because you might go in with this plan and you're like, yeah, this is going to work. And then you just get sideswiped, you get taken out of the game because you didn't know something that was crucial to your investment plan. He boned. T-boned out of the game. <laughs> That's why so I've T-boned. You can get T-boned real quick. I see yeah. people like hunting different markets and not doing the proper research. Um, yeah. you, you brought up property taxes, but also other types of taxes as well, like land transfer taxes. Um, different provinces will have um, okay. different provinces will have different um, uh, types of rules for land transfer taxes. Um, I was, we were just having a, a coaching call on Thursday and, uh, and we were talking to one of our mentees in Ontario and we were reviewing a Burr project and we were going through the numbers and everything else. And he's like, ah, yeah. And land transfer taxes. And I'm like, Ooh, Ooh, that's a, that's a big expense. <laughs> it's a big expense that suddenly really affected the bottom line on that deal. Not to say that, you know, Ontario is a bad place to invest, but you have to take those things into consideration. You really need to understand it. Um, you also mentioned um, local zoning rules and re regulations as well. Uh, if you're planning on adding a secondary suite, 
if you're planning on doing a redevelopment, you need to really truly understand what am I allowed to do? You got to understand the different zoning. Um, I remember early on when we were getting started, we were looking at um, one of our biggest main strategies when we were getting started was adding secondary suites. And we found these really amazing deals in the same neighborhoods that were normally um, that we were normally uh, doing. Uh, but and I almost put an offer on a property, and then I learned that that type of zoning you were even though I had a side second entrance, even uh, a side entrance um, uh, for the basement, it had the proper parking, it had the ceiling height, it even had a kitchen and a few bedrooms downstairs. I learned that that zoning you were not allowed to actually um, get a, a have a permitted suite. You couldn't apply for it. And we were this close to buying it. It was a really amazing deal. And Gabby talked earlier about having um, investor-focused professionals on your team and realtors. And I, and I put my hand up. That's because uh, one of our first early realtors uh, didn't understand what a legal suite was. And uh, one of our first properties that we bought had a secondary suite. It was all completed. We didn't learn until after we, we um, sorry, we knew that it was a non-conforming suite, but she told us that we could legalize it. And we found out afterwards that we couldn't at that time. Now, hope, thankfully, later on, they changed the rules, the zoning rules, uh, and allowed secondary suites uh, in duplexes. And we were able to go and, and do the work that needed to be done and get it legalized. But there was a few years there that we couldn't rent out the basement right? Legally. Um, so just make sure you understand the local zoning laws. If that's a strategy you're planning on doing, right? Um, if, if planning on redeveloping, um, whether it be a basement or, or tearing down the whole house and redeveloping it and doing a build. Um, and then the building codes as well, lastly. The building codes are important because um, I talked about ceiling height there a second ago. Um, don't buy a property that has a low ceiling height that you cannot raise the ceiling height in order to make it a legal suite. We got one property that uh, we almost bought as well, that the the stairwell going down, the ceiling height on the stairs wasn't high enough. In fact, um, we have one that we, we, we never actually legalized, but you can't get a queen size bed down the stairs. You have to like fold it in half. The like we, we um, uh, the, the, the box, what do you call it? The box spring? Box spring, yeah. Yeah, um, the box spring can't get down there. You can't fold a box spring unless you want to cut it in half and fold it um, or, or, or you have to perhaps get, you know, one of the, the two piece box springs to get it down there. So that was a huge oversight for us. Now, you know, we, it's not a legal basement. It's not a basement suite down there, but if somebody wanted to use the bedroom down there, you can't get a bed down there not unless it's a, a mattress on the floor, things that you got. That's that one was like a, a convenience thing or an inconvenience thing. But if you're planning on legalizing adding a secondary suite and you can't raise the ceiling because there's stairs, here's here's the example. It was stairs downstairs and then stairs right above it. You can't raise stairs above you. Or you can't raise you can't remove a beam that's going right through it, not without restructuring, like reconfiguring the whole house and having it cost a lot of money. So lots of things to consider um, um, as far as the regulatory and legal considerations. Yeah. Okay, so that was um, our little segment here on analyzing the market. So um, I hope that if uh, those kind of fundamentals on market analysis was new to you, that maybe you grab some screenshots um, because they're all just so, so important in making sound investment decisions. And um, you know, you can really, like Wayne said, I, I guess it's a better term, get T-boned um, if you don't understand. Some of these, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you don't understand these these fundamentals and they really do matter, it's, um, you know, I think people just get comfortable investing in wherever maybe they've that's where they've, you know, have a couple of rentals. They've always gone well, but then they decide they want to get into, you know, something else in real estate investing and they don't revisit these fundamentals. Yeah. Does this make sense for this other investment strategy? Is this a, still a good market for, um, you know, this strategy? And also, like Wayne said, the markets are are cyclical. They're not always the same. There's going to be, you know, periods of time where there's tons of migration and periods of time where people are like, we're getting the heck out of here. There's nothing going on. And so is it a nice kind of steady market where not much changes and you can just feel safe? Or is it a market where you need to keep educating yourself and stay up on what's happening what Keep are you your doing? finger on the pulse. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Keep your finger on the pulse. You gotta stay. You gotta stay on it. Yeah. You can't just. You can't just get lazy. And also, I'll add that um, don't just do what other people are doing. Yes. If you see me posting that I'm doing something, doesn't mean that it's the right thing for you. 
or it doesn't mean that I haven't taken other things into consideration or not even using me as an example, just following people on podcasts. Oh my God, there's these people buying in Florida. Oh my God, there's these people. Dominican Republic, I heard. I went for vacation there once. I, I, I think it's really nice. I love the community and everything else. I saw that someone's buying over there and it's only $250,000 for a condo and it rents for this. You don't know anything about it. You got to do your research. A lot more regulatory and legal considerations, especially when you're looking at different provinces and different countries. Lots to consider. And don't just assume because someone is doing it that it must work. Or because they just bought something that, it, that that you can do it too. You have to do your own due diligence. Remember, why are we doing this? Right, we're yeah. doing this for the freedom. We're doing this for our family. It's going to be different for all of you, but like, there's a reason why you're here today, and there's a reason why you're interested. Make sure you keep that in mind, and don't take the unnecessary risks um, if if you don't need to. Not without yeah. doing the proper due diligence. Yeah. I like um, just quickly before we move on, um, just this example came into my mind of just like something that people, you know, you just might not know about if you're looking at a different market. And um, on our uh, REI Masters Mentorship um, group coaching call this past Thursday, um, we were running numbers with one of our mentees and um, he's he's given Wayne the numbers and Wayne's like, okay. And then like, oh, I guess we should put closing costs in here too. So we'll, we'll I it. literally said that when you walked away. I just told oh, this story. Really? Oh. I just told this story. <laughs> I don't know what you ran upstairs so, for. I ran away for a second. <laughs> like Gabby ran by. I'm like, okay, I guess I'll just cover this for a minute. And I literally just told oh, that that's story. Funny. Yeah. Yeah. The 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 land transfer tax. Yeah. Cause yeah. Wayne, you and I never talked about it after the call because I had to go put Everly to bed and you yeah. stayed on the call for a few hours. And is he here? I got to talk about that, but that just like it, it just made me laugh so hard. And he's like, Yeah, 1500. And he's like, Uh, no, 9,000. And you're like, Oh, <laughs> <I'm> like, oh <laughs> that really that hurts, really just affected your burr project and get all, all your money out. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's funny. that's so funny that I brought it up again. Sorry about that. And guys. are we not perfect for each other? Yeah, <laughs> we finish each other's sandwiches, sandwiches. Okay, so we've analyzed the market. How are we going to find these darn deals? Yes. Like I mentioned earlier, we, we were definitely going to cover this for you guys. Yeah. So um, there's lots of different ways to find deals, um, depending what exactly you are, what strategy you're using, what types of properties you're looking for. You might consider some of these different um, methods of finding deals. Um, but we'll kind of go over them all and maybe where they kind of best fit into, into the different strategies. That yeah. sounds um, so the first one, which we've already talked about is using a realtor and finding on market properties on the MLS. Can you find deals on the MLS? Hell yeah. Yeah. Like almost all of ours. Yeah. Yeah. If you know what you're looking for and you know what unique opportunity, I, I'm going to keep saying that's the other two words I'm going to say today is unique opportunities. You have to be able to identify you a unique opportunity. And sometimes if you're smart and creative, other people won't know that that's not an opportunity, right? You don't always have to go against the grain, but I'm just saying that, um, and even if it's not, like there's there's plenty of deals out there. There's plenty of deals out there that are just good old fashioned, good cash flowing vanilla properties. Doesn't have to be super complicated and they're on MLS all day, Yeah. right? And if and the price also, doesn't work for you, you just write a lower offer to keep writing offers. Yeah. I'll also say that if you are a new investor that I highly, highly, highly recommend using a realtor um, to help you with your transaction. An investor-focused realtor um, that can help you with the transaction because they are going to do all of the hard lifting and they're going to do the negotiating. They're going to make sure that it fits the type of um, property that you're looking for. They're going to find the little bumps in the road that you hadn't considered. They're going to bring them to light for you. They're going to discuss what your options are. They're going to like, there's so much stuff that a realtor does for you that um, I think that we just kind of like brush off as more um, experienced investors, more experienced who are, you think, you know, everything and, and, you know, you forget about all the things you didn't know when you were starting out. And um, a realtor can really save you a lot of pain in kind of like missing things or not getting the best price or, you know, knowing when to walk away or knowing when to push harder and those types of things. So um, if you're new, I really suggest um, using a realtor and, and letting them help you on this journey. 
And not to mention the fact that the access to the information and data that they have that you don't have. Yeah. Right. Um, if you're looking for off-market properties, for example, or you're trying to do it yourself, you don't have access to um, properties that have sold. And I'm not going to really get too far into this today and, and actually how to determine the value of a property, how to know whether you're buying it for the right price or not. But I'm going to give you a very simple um, one sentence explanation of how it works. The market is the market. You do not get to decide what a property is worth. And what I mean is that the price in which a, a similar property with similar features in a similar area, the price in which a property just like the subject property has sold for recently will determine the value of the property that you were subject property you were looking at. For example, you got two side by uh, two houses next door to each other, exact same layout, exact same square footage, exact same features, exact same condition, exact same everything. If your neighbor sells the house for $400,000 on market, your house is now worth $400,000. If your neighbor is a, is a jerk and sells it for three twenty five dollars because they need to move across the country very quickly, guess what? Your house is now worth three twenty five. dollars and you can you can flip them the bird as they leave across the country. Be like, dude, what you? Because the market is the market. That's how it's determined. Now, if you happen to find some schmuck who buys your house for four fifty, then the house, then all the houses that are similar in the area are now worth four fifty, and that's how it's determined. So um, that information is available through only realtors have access to that. They have access to what houses have sold for in the area recently within the last 6, 12, 24 months. You need that information to know if you're paying the right price for the property. And that's what a realtor is going to be able to do for you. They're going to be able to say, okay, cool. I know it's listed for 400. Let's see what other houses have sold for similar to this in the last six months. I see one for 375. I see one for 450. I see one for 600. That seems to be a bit of an outlier. We'll just forget about that one. But let's just kind of see, okay, they're all kind of in and around 400. This one had an extra bedroom. This one had a little extra of this. This one had a, a bullet holes in the wall. So that's why it's a little, worth a little bit less. Taking all that into consideration, Gabby, yes, $400,000 is a good price. Let's see if we can offer a little bit lower and see if they'll take it. If you don't have that data, you don't know if you're overpaying for a property. You don't. You have no idea. Additionally, I'd, I'll add on that if you're planning on doing a little bit of work to the property, and you want to know, after I do this little bit of work, after I add this addition, after I finish the basement, after I add a legal basement suite, after I add a garage, what is this house going to be worth? The realtor is going to be able to pull other sole comparables that are similar to what you're planning to build it to, to give you an idea of what the after repair value is going to be. This is why Gabby is saying, like, if, if you're new, this is a really important data to, um, to know that whether you're overpaying for a property or if the strategy you're planning on implementing to this property and the work you're planning on doing is actually worth it. Because if it doesn't increase the value, then it's not worth it, right? Realtor is completely worth it. If, if, if you can use a realtor and still find really good deals, I highly recommend it. They provide so much value to your business. The next one's driving for dollars. Um, so now this would be more of an off market, not using a realtor type strategy. And that's just plain and simple, just getting in your car, driving around neighborhoods, looking for houses. Now, this strategy is more, I would say, for looking for houses that are distressed, which will be, are we getting into? After the yeah, break? we're going to be talking about After distressed the, properties. Yeah. The difference between a turnkey property and a distressed property. Um so if you're looking for a house that maybe you can buy for a really good deal, get a really good deal on an undervalued, and then add some work to it and um, increase the value of it, then you can go and just drive around neighborhoods and look for houses that are a little dilapidated. Look for bullet holes in the front window. Look for boarded up windows. Look for... Um... I, wouldn't, I wouldn't look for bullet holes because it's probably not a great neighborhood. Okay, the neighborhood's probably not the greatest. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm just saying, look for obvious signs of distress or motivation where a seller is going to be willing to move that property quickly. Or look for signs that the house needs some work that would create an opportunity, a unique opportunity for you to be able to buy that house, do the work that's required, make that investment and increase the value more so that you could potentially turn a profit, okay? So driving for dollars is another opportunity. 
um, flyers. Uh, so what you can do is you can, um, while you're out driving for dollars, maybe you walk for dollars. Maybe you're out, you got a hundred flyers in your pocket. And if you see a property that, uh, that you think would, would, would work really well for the strategy or the type of property that you're looking for, put that flyer in their mailbox. You can additionally, what you can do is you can, um, uh, do a mail campaign, maybe call up Canada post or some other auto mail company where you can have a flyer. Uh, or letters or something like that, where they will mail it out to certain addresses or to a certain neighborhood. And then the seller or the owner would get that that flyer or that piece of mail that says, hi, I'm a real estate investor and I'm interested in buying your house, right? So that's another good way to find deals. Um, and then just wait for the phone to ring. Uh, yellow signs, you can kind of see it there. There's a little yellow sign, a picture of one. It says, we buy houses, any situation, any condition, cash. Um. Those are really flashy and uh, they get people's attention. So you can put them on a, maybe at a red light. Um, you can put them at a stop sign. You can put them in a neighborhood that you are planning that you're hoping to buy houses in. Put your phone number there. And if someone is interested in selling, they can call. Side note, caveat to that, make sure you understand your local regulations and laws and bylaws. Okay. You got to understand your market. Because uh, you might get a phone call from uh, your local police department saying, excuse me, uh, who are you and why are you putting these signs here? Because there's a bylaw that says you can't. Um, yeah, they have your number, so <laughs> they're going to call you. And I know personal experience uh, through different um, forms of marketing that I've done for different businesses, I've gotten a phone call. And I've gotten phone calls from uh, angry neighbors in the area that don't like us littering them with their stupid yellow signs. Um, but they are an attractive, I don't mean all that attractive, but they, they, they catch your attention. They're big and they're yellow and they're like cash and now and any situation, um, what you're trying to attract is someone who's in a motivated, um, position who needs a solution. And if they see that and they call, um, there's an opportunity for you to get a really good deal. Yeah. Um, on the, on the flip side of yellow signs, um, you know, we're calling them yellow signs. They don't specifically need to be yellow. There's a lot of white ones out there, <laughs> but they're usually the like, we buy houses signs. Yeah. That's what they should be called. We buy houses. Um, on the flip side of that is you can use it as a way to get distressed seller or distressed yeah sellers to call you to find an opportunity to find that deal. But what you can also do is you can call the number on that sign and say, Hey, um, I'm actually looking to buy a house. If you, um, you know, come across one that you're not taking for yourself, um, you know, I'm interested in finding good deals on houses. And now you've gotten onto their list of, you know, if they're pumping, if they're a wholesaler or if they're, you know, maybe they're flippers, but um, they can't take every deal and they want to, you know, maybe make a quick buck selling it to you. Um, you can do that as well. Um, there's a question in regards to, um, uh, a little, it, it's a bit of a rewind, but I'm just going to answer the question here rather than uh, messaging the person. Uh, someone was asking about, um, you know, self evaluation or market evaluations uh, of properties. And um, they were mentioning Honest Door. There's a website called Honest Door where you can um, log in and you can see previously sold properties. Um, now, it is a very slow way of accessing information to see what properties have sold for. What you can do is you can type in an address and see when, uh, how many times that property sold in the last few years or what it sold for. Um, if you were to go through a street and literally type in every address and see what it sold for, yes, you could get that information. Uh, the one problem with Honest Door is that it is a delayed, um, uh, it's delayed data. So I don't know how often they pull the data for the sold comparables um, uh, for, for, from MLS. However, I, I believe it was at least six months. So every six months, they pull data to see what properties have sold for. And then they take that data to determine what they believe their honest door price or value of a property is. So it's kind of old data. Now, if another property has sold within the last month, two months, three months, and they haven't um, pulled that data and updated the honest door price uh, or price evaluation, then you have old data. So you want to make sure you have the most up-to-date recent data, because if your neighbor just sold it yesterday, that data needs to be added into the average or the value of the property. Uh, sorry, to the, into the equation to determine what the value of your property actually is. To know that you're getting the right, um, that, you're, that you're paying the right price for a property. So it's... 
I use Honest Door on a regular basis to, as it's just a, a very fast um, way to- It's a starting point. It's a starting point to get information, but don't use it as um, as a cheap way of, you know, or an accurate way of determining the value of a property. Um, it's just, it's, it's, it's limited, and it, but it's a starting point. Um, uh, there's a, there was, uh, uh, I, uh, Paul, Paul will answer your question perhaps on the morning show. Um, well, we want to stay on track and make sure that we're, um, not getting too far off. I, I, I'm, a, I'm very guilty of this. I'm very guilty of like over delivering and answering questions. Great questions. Um, but I want to make sure that we stay on track. Uh, I, in fact, actually Gabby and I mentioned, uh, we talked about this before and we said, we're not going to answer any questions. And here I am <laughs> answering yeah. questions. Um, I'm a giver. Yeah. I'm a giver. We, uh, what we wanted to make sure is we wanted to make sure that we stayed on track and ended when we said we were going to, because we're so grateful that you're all here with us today. And we don't want to keep you longer than we said we were going to. Yeah. I know you have other commitments. Okay. For sure. So the next one is for sale by owner. Yep. You want to talk about that? Yep. So for sale by owner is uh, is when a, a seller or an owner sells their property by themselves um, rather than using hiring a broker or a professional like a realtor. Um, so uh, a seller would do this sometimes because, uh, put, it, put it bluntly, uh, they're cheap. Um, they don't want to. So in a, in a transaction, a real estate transaction, the seller normally pays for the realtors. And they'll pay for their realtor, the selling realtor, and they'll also pay for the buying realtor. So uh, when you're when you're transacting on real estate as a buyer, you don't pay any realtor fees. So always use a realtor. You're not paying for it. Why not? Right? Um, the seller will actually pay for your realtor's fees. Normally, that's there's there's a there's a percentage of of the purchase price that goes towards it, um, and that gets deducted from the proceeds of the sale. Um, now, sometimes if a seller is, wants to save that money, sometimes a seller doesn't like realtors, sometimes a seller uh, wants to test the market, or maybe the seller doesn't have all that much equity and they can't afford to pay a realtor. Um, if, uh, if they've uh, leveraged a mortgage on their property, say for example, it's worth 400, but they got a, um, a mortgage that's worth uh, 395, it means they only have $5,000 worth of equity, their proceeds. There might not be enough there. Well, there very likely isn't enough to pay for their realtor and the buyer's realtor because they have closing costs, because they have land transfer taxes and all those other things that 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 are required when you sell a property. And if there's nine thousand dollars in land transfer taxes and closing costs for 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 paying for their lawyer and they've only got five thousand dollars worth of equity and they don't have anything in savings. Well, they're in a bit of a pickle, so they definitely cannot afford to pay for a realtor. So they might just throw a sign on the lawn or in the window that says for sale by owner, right? And if you're driving around and you see one, or perhaps you're on Facebook or Kijiji or wherever else, whether buy and sell pages, um, you see a sign that says for sale by owner. And you're like, okay, I can call the, the owner directly and have a discussion with them, right? And normally you wouldn't have um, a realtor uh, represent you in that circumstance um, because the seller is not going to pay for their fee. So if you had a realtor represent you, you would be responsible for their fee, which could be, um, on average, what say, uh, 3.5, uh, percent of the, or, or 3% of the, of the purchase price, $400,000 property, you're looking at about $12,000, right? So, um, it, it, it can be worth it, or perhaps you would just maybe just deal with the, the seller on your own. And um, looking for a for sale by owner sign says, um, you know, there is normally some form of motivation uh, from the seller to, to sell on their own. And maybe that might be a unique opportunity for you to provide a solution, utilizing um, uh, your ability to close quickly or utilizing other different creative strategies that you can uh, apply um, to solve their problem. So it's a great way to find unique opportunities. Uh, and lastly, wholesalers. Um, wholesaling, uh, I, I believe we talked about um, at the very beginning of our of our boot camp today. Wholesaling is um, I'm not going to get into the strategy too much because we're going to get into it tomorrow for you. Uh, but wholesalers, what they do is they find off they they are gifted uh, in finding off market opportunities. So they find off market deals, they lock them up, and uh, they will sell them to you for a fee. So perhaps they call for sale by owners and. Uh, 
and, and they get a really good deal where there's a nice spread there or a nice opportunity to do something with that property. And they say, hey, it's uh, it's this $400,000 property. I locked it up for $300,000 and um, I'm charging a $10,000 wholesale fee. So you're getting a $400,000 property for three hundred dollars three uh, plus $10,000. So you're getting it for $310,000, which is fantastic. You've got a $90,000 profit, right? On, in, in, on the buy. So wholesalers, um, they, they use lots of different forms of marketing to find these off-market opportunities. They're the guys that are pumping out 10,000 flyers every month and, and letters to all the, the owners in the area. They're the ones with the yellow signs that you can call and say, hey, I'm looking for deals. They're the ones that are calling for sale by owner uh, signs. They're the ones that are out there just pumping out tons and tons of money into marketing. And they have all these different funnels for, for leads. And they're the one closing them. And um, they have the ability, um, the, the, the gifted ability to be able to find these really cool opportunities and these deals. And then they, 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 they basically just charge you a fee for it. And they always make sure that they leave enough meat on the bone. Um, and because I, I, I know a few guys are like, oh, $10,000. Who cares? You still got a $90,000 deal, right? What if they charge $50,000? Who cares? You made $50,000 on the buy, right? So um, wholesalers are, are, are really fantastic as well. And um, uh, Gabby said a really good tip on how to, how to find wholesalers is to look for those yellow signs and call them and say, I don't have a house to sell, but I'm a real estate investor. I'm looking for good deals. I'm looking for these types of deals. Can you find me one? And get on their list, get on their mailing list or have them looking for properties that you're looking for, right? Saves you a whole heck of a lot of trouble than calling them yourself and putting yellow signs out. Because I'm sure a lot of you guys got a job. I'm sure a lot of you guys got a family. I'm sure a lot of you guys are very busy. You got lots going on. Build that power team. That power team also includes wholesalers. Includes uh, having a good realtor on your team and then them knowing what it is that you're looking for. If you tell people what it is you're looking for, you have a good solid power team of people doing all the work for you. You can just sit back and be the CEO. That's what you're trying to do here. You're trying to build a business where you're the CEO and you have different departments, marketing departments, sales departments, you got um, all your power team and everything else. You have them do all the legwork for you, right? And you be the CEO. Awesome. Have hey, so that's where and how you find deals once you've chosen your market. Awesome. And I'm uh, just looking at the time here. We pretty much nailed it. So we are going to take a break right now. Um, it's 10 to 12. So we're going to take a half hour break and we will be what? a little far away from the mic. Oh, okay. We're going to take a half hour break and we'll be back at 1220 for the uh, last part of day one. All right, everyone, we are back from break. And Wayne and I are ready to dive right back in. We're going to be getting into types of properties, um, turnkey versus distressed. So, and talking about joint ventures and OPM as well. I just want to tell everybody that um, um, while we're waiting for everyone to come back with their fresh, warm coffees and glasses of water, and um, uh, Gabby and I were, uh, were we're just going to make our coffees and wanted to have a little snack. And uh, Gabby goes, "Oh, that's." Uh, you look really nice. And I'm like, oh, you like my 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 master's jacket? She goes, yeah. I'm like, you don't get the joke, do you? She never put it together. The master's golf tournament, green jacket, master's, REI master's. She never got the joke. I thought it was funny. I, I call it my master's jacket. <laughs> I get it now. Now she gets it. Now she gets it. <laughs> okay. So turnkey versus distressed when we're talking about uh, types of properties. Yeah. So, um, you know, you may have heard the term turnkey and imagine that just meaning that you go to buy a property that you can literally put the key into, turn it, open up the door and your tenants can move in. Good to go. Good to go. So there's no improvements required. We're ready to rent. There's nothing you have to do. All you need to do is, um, you know, that that how to buy a, a property slide that we went through before lunch. You just need to go through those motions and then find your tenants and move them in. Yeah, and 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 maybe maybe the picture is a little misleading. A lot of people think that turnkey means brand new. It doesn't necessarily, not necessarily the case. Um, but when you're comparing it to the, to the, um, to the other example of distress, distress is like, okay, we seriously need to take care of something right out of the gate. Turnkey means that nothing needs to be done. So that might mean an older property. It might mean a, pro a property that's, you know, um, 
not quite newly renovated. It doesn't need to be newly renovated, or, or but th there may be some things that are required in the future, maybe some, some deferred maintenance. But uh, generally speaking, this property is ready to be run as a business. It's ready to be rented. So you can turn the key, tenants can move in, no immediate work required. Distress is a little bit different, right? Yeah, so with distressed properties, um, it's quite uh, clear that renovations are needed. There's some repairs that need to be done. Uh, basically, it's it's not ready to rent. So if you were to go find um, tenants right now, they would walk in and go, uh, seriously? Yeah. I'm not moving into this. <laughs> uh, this is I don't, not I don't, habitable. Yeah, unhabitable, yeah. Well, and it might and it might be habitable, but like be really like worn down and just clearly not, um, you know, up to standard for what should be on the market. Yeah. So that's uh, kind of the definition of distressed. We talked earlier about how um, many ways that you can like find the distressed ones. Like if you're out driving for dollars and and uh, you're looking for the curled shingles on the roof or the overgrown yard or the broken windows, like those types of things that have been neglected nobody's bothered to update them or to do anything with them that's kind of your your telltale signs of a property being distressed yeah and so like a turnkey property you're not normally going to get a real deal on it not unless somebody has some motivation that's outside of um all the examples of you know the distressed property but a turnkey property like there's not a whole uh, the seller's not going to be as motivated so you're probably going to be paying market value or maybe you might get lucky and get a little under market value if there's other other factors at play in play um with distress though um you know there's a lot more opportunities right next slide next slide we're good at it <laughs> Why do we like distressed properties? Because there's opportunities. Um, uh, the possibilities uh, is, is, is the term I see in the slide here. The possibilities and opportunities. So when a property is distressed, uh, normally, um, I like. Sorry, I I'll say this. I don't like the word distress, but I'll use this. I'll use the word distress when I'm when I'm um, uh, referring to a property. I don't like the term distressed sellers. Um, I am a capitalist. I am an entrepreneur. I'm a business owner. Um, I make money um, by finding opportunities in the market. And as a capitalist, I understand that um, by definition, someone wins and someone loses, right? I don't like that. I don't. I, I, though I am a capitalist and I am a business owner and I'm a, um, an entrepreneur, um, I don't like making money when people, I, I don't like making money and knowing that someone else lost money. Um, so I like, I can use the, the term distressed when I'm referring to houses, uh, when I'm referring to owners, I mean, more motivated. I like the word motivated. There are reasons why the seller is motivated to accept less than what the house is worth. There are reason why the seller is willing to work with you, uh, in other aspects of the sale, um, because they have reasons behind it. I like to focus on providing solutions as opposed to taking advantage of people. Um, so maybe I just maybe I just wanted to spread the word a little bit more about um, for you guys because I'd like you to kind of take this message and I'd like you to t to take this same belief system and 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 these values um, along when you're building your businesses and when you're helping other people um, buy properties as well. We don't want to take advantage of people. Um, sometimes when there's distressed houses, there's reasons behind it, and it might be it might be some sad reasons. It might be maybe they're going through some different. Um, some hard times in their life. Uh, maybe some things have happened to them that are outside of their control. And we do not want to step over people or step on people in order to make money. So um, think of yourself as a solution provider and think of all of these things that we're teaching you today and all the things that you're gonna learn in the future as you continue to invest in yourself and learn. I want you to use those strategies. I want you to use the things that you learn to help people and provide solutions so you can create a win-win. You can help them out of their situation. You can help them get the best case scenario and the best outcome possible. Simultaneously, you are going to profit based on uh, based off of the the understanding and expertise that you have. Right? So so important. Okay. I, I want you guys to make money, but I don't want you to step on and over people in order to make that money. So. Uh, when you find distressed properties, um, you're going to utilize some of the strategies we're going to teach you tomorrow, which some of them are listed today. Um, and that could be you can renovate the property. Maybe the seller doesn't have the finances or the ability 
um, to renovate the property before they sell it. That's the problem that they have. Hey, this house is in really bad shape. I don't have the $40,000 to fix these things. So therefore, the price is going to be adjusted accordingly. And you, Mr. Investor or Mrs. Investor, can come in and 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 renovate it and then hopefully increase the value and make a profit. So um, you can renovate it and keep it. So when you renovate it, you increase the property, uh, the value of the property more than the money that you spent. So you can make some equity on it, keep it as a rental property, keep it for a long time. Um, yeah. I you think can in, in the in the simple renovate and keep, um, I think what we're um, kind of highlighting here is that sometimes sometimes they just need a little bit of paint and a little refresher. And that can sometimes be, you know, only requiring $5,000 or something like that, where if you get a good enough deal, you're okay just pumping, you know, a few grand into it to tidy it up, get it cleaned up, paint it, freshen it up, and then just get tenants in. You don't need to worry about a refinance. You don't need to worry about anything. It's just like a little bit of, they call it lipstick yeah. um, in the industry. So just you, you put a little bit of lipstick on her and she's ready to go. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and now, Gabby, you mentioned refinance. So for those of you guys who have never heard of the strategy, we'll be talking about it tomorrow, but it's called the BRRRR strategy. And the BRRRR stands for buy, renovate, rent, refinance, and repeat. So it's a very, very creative strategy where um, you can use the financing to, you get the property, for, I don't want to explain it all because we're going to do it tomorrow, but you get the property, you buy it, you do some renovations, you increase the value significantly more than the value of the property and what you spent on it. And then you, what you can do is go back to the bank and the bank will reappraise it for a higher value and give you a new mortgage, which will pay out um, all or most or some of the money that you've spent originally on the purchase and the renovations so that you can get your money back out and then you have the same money here again, rather than just putting it in and, and having it sit there, you can get some of it back out. You get your original down payment, your renovation funds, and then you can go and repeat the process again and buy another property. So it allows you to, it's a very cool unique strategy that allows you to recycle your funds. If you only have a certain amount, let's say you only had hundred K and you didn't want to just put it all into one property. You want to buy multiple properties. So you put it in, you do this really cool financing maneuver and renovation maneuver, and then you get your money back out and then you can use it again on a different property and you get to keep the property. That's my, that's the simplest way I can do it. I'm sorry. That's, that's, that's as simple as I'm going to go, uh, that I can go. And that's, that's as much as we're going to explain. We're going to explain more about that tomorrow and how much money and how, how you can utilize that to grow your portfolio. Uh, fix and flip is like the oldest, like, um, strategy. Every This is the one that everybody knows. Everybody knows fix and flip. You buy a property, you fix it up, you sell it for profit, right? And this is, you know, um, used in, in many other different, um, you know, businesses as well, where you'll buy something and then you'll do some work to it, or you'll, you'll turn it around and, and, and fix what's wrong with it and then increase the value and sell it for profit. Fix and flip is, um, is a bit of a riskier strategy, but uh, you can definitely, it, it's used on distressed houses, houses where there is something wrong with it that can be fixed, where you can increase the value for more and sell for profit. So lots of opportunities for fix and flip and burr um, strategy when you're looking at distressed properties. And then lastly is wholesale and assign. So we talked about wholesaling earlier. These are the people that I, I, I've never called wholesalers gifted before. This is the first time today, but it, it is a gift. You know what I mean? It, like it's, um, I don't know. I just, I thought it was, I thought it was overdue. Um, what you could potentially do is get a really good deal under contract. Um, and then you can assign your interest in that contract to somebody else. So say you've got a distressed property, there's a huge spread or there's a huge opportunity to do a fix and flip. And I call up Gabby and say, Hey, I've got this house. It's, um, it's worth $400,000 uh, renovated. I've got it under contract here to buy it in two weeks for $250,000. Only takes about $50,000 worth of renovations to make it worth four hundred. dollars It's a $100,000 spread there. I'll sell you my contract for $10,000. Gabby thinks, okay, I'm going to buy this property for two sixty. dollars I'm going to put fifty dollars into it. There's a $90,000 spread there. I'm going to pay realtor fees, holding costs, everything else. I could potentially make fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 on this thing. So if you have a really good deal, you can also assign your interest in the property. Um, so again, summarize way more options and unique opportunities, uh, when you're dealing with distressed properties, as opposed to something that's turnkey, all you got to do is it, it, it really depends on you and, and which direction you're planning on going and your goals, right? Do you want a turnkey or do you want to distress? I'm not trying to sell everybody on distress because I promise you there's more risks involved. There's a lot more work involved. 
It really depends on you and what your strategies are, sorry, what your strategy is to get to getting you towards your goals. And so when you're trying to determine whether you want turnkey or distress, I really want you to think uh, again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to repeat this one a lot uh, this weekend too. begin with the end in mind. Um, it was, um, I believe it's uh, Stephen Covey's second, second of seven habits of highly effective uh, people. Um, it's, it's my Bible. It's, it's what I, what I live my life by. Um, you got to know where it is that you're going and where it is that you plan on going. And then you need to build a roadmap in order to get there. And that's something that we do in the REI Masters Mentorship Program is really help you get clear on, on what it is that you're trying to do and what your goals are. And then how do we determine what types of strategies or what types of properties you should be buying in order to get you to your goals? So think, think ahead, begin with the end in mind, reverse engineer your goals, and then determine which type of house should I be buying in order to get me to that? Or what strategy should I be doing? Absolutely. Okay. And I think that also like when we look at um, turnkey, uh, basically it's it's ready to rent. So it's going to be a rental or maybe a rent. If you have a rent to own business, it could be a rent to own. But aside from that, there's not opportunities within it. It's just that it's ready to go. So if that's what your goals are, is to just get some stuff, you don't have time or resources to do renovations and find the properties and you just want to build a portfolio, then they're fantastic because you don't need to do anything. They're ready to go. But yeah, these just, it, it allows you to get a little bit more creative and utilizing your money and um, that sort of thing. So. Okay. I got a question. Can I answer it? Okay. I think we have the time today. I think we have the time today. Um, so Brandon uh, says, uh, what about situations where our methods cannot help somebody and they're doomed for foreclosure? Is there any way to help them? I mean, if they get a fair cash offer, it's better than nothing, but they're still out. Like they're still out money. Um, uh, the market, sorry, I, I lost my spot here. Uh, the market could be heading a direction where people owe a lot more than the property uh, value is uh, they have is worth. Is there any way to help in these situations? I think that when you approach business or real estate investing with a business, uh, for this example, when you approach it with a win-win win, win, win mentality, um, it, do the best that you can right? Do the best that you can. Make sure that you're not overreaching and it's affecting you and your family and your livelihood. But I think that Brandon, you know, you've taken lots of courses now, you know, you've, you've invested in yourself, you have education, you have coaching. Um, you have a ton of you, you are, you're blessed with the ability to have a ton of different solutions and, and expertise and knowledge. If you can pass that along to them, and like, if, if there's no way that you can um, profit from this and, 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 or maybe perhaps by you taking this deal on, it might actually be a, a, a ne negative um, impact on you and your family. You still have lots of, we, we all know lots of different ways we can help these people out. So, you know, um, Brandon, if you have, if you can share something with them that can help them avoid um, pitfalls or help them avoid um, potentially being foreclosed on or going bankrupt, I think you should share it with them. Right. Um, just there's, there's lots of ways to make money and to help people. And then there's, then there's just helping people in general and being a good human being and being a good, um, what, whatever religious background you have, being a good Muslim, being a good, um, Christian, being a good, or just being a good person in general. I think that, um, I, I, I certainly do. Right. If when, when I was out actively looking for off-market deals, which has been a few years now, we've, we've kind of transitioned into different things. And I, I'm more of a CEO than a hustler now. So I, my hustling days are uh, somewhat over. But when I was in my hustling mode years ago, um, I always told sellers, uh, off-market sellers, uh, whether it be for creative deals or for wholesaling, um, if it doesn't work for both of us, and I don't want to do it, and I don't think you should do it either, right? I only want to do this if it's win-win, right? And if it's not going to be a win for you, or if it's not going to be a win for me, then we don't do it, right? So let's try and find a solution where we can both win from this. And we can both, you know, get the outcome that we want. And if not, here's 10 other options of things that you can do. If you have better options, I'm always going to give you the better option because I can't sleep at night. I can't move forward knowing that I'm, 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 I'm stepping on someone or stepping over someone in order to, to, to profit, in order to be successful. I'll never do it, ever. I always want to make sure that everyone gets the most benefit. Um, it's just, it's just the way that I move through life. And I, I've found that, um, I don't know, I, I, I call it, call it positive energy, call it the, what do they call it? The, um, 
think off the top of my head, but like when you put, when you put good energy out there, um, you get, you get good energy coming back, call it karma, call it whatever you want. Um, I found that being a good person, uh, it, it, it pays better dividends than, than being a nurse and taking advantage of people. I truly do. So be a good person and, and life will reciprocate. That whole time I had the biggest smile on my face because I was thinking is I had T Swift karma going on in my head. You serious right now? (laughs) An impactful moment like that, and you're gonna make a Taylor Swift reference afterwards. Yeah. (laughs) Or we could just move along. (laughs) Okay. So where do we get money to buy properties? So maybe you're not somebody that's uh, sitting on a mill. Got a pretty mill in your bank account. A mill? Uh, you mean like a like a pulp mill? Like your family owns a pulp mill? Or do you mean like a mill isn't like a million? A million dollars. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Or a pulp mill. I mean, if you're sitting on a pulp mill, maybe you got lots of cash flowing too. Yeah. Okay. Whatever yeah. kind of mill you want. <laughs> Lumber prices are up. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So if you're not one of those people, so sitting on a million or or a mill, um. Where do we get the money to buy properties? Yeah. Yeah. And um, I say this all the time. And and for the people that we coach and mentor and just anyone who asks, um, we all come to that realization eventually. Though uh, everyone, though everyone is ridiculously stubborn in the in the early days. Um, I was. Uh, Gabby, you must remember. I said, I do not want to partner with anyone. I want to do it on my own. I don't want other people involved. Most of us who who want to get into real estate investing, I'd, I'd say a large majority of people who want to get into real estate investing or entrepreneurship, you're very, um, um, you're a do-it-yourselfer. You're, you want to be in control. And the thought of having someone else involved or the thought of calling up your friends and family and asking them for money uh, it just sounds terrible. And I agree with you. In the early days, I, I felt the exact same way. I, I was not interested in it. I'm going to do it myself. I'll figure it out. I would rather find creative seller financing deals than uh, ask people for money. That was my my, my belief system around it. But um, we all come to the realization eventually that uh, we are going to need help. Uh, we're going to need help with financing. We're going to need money. We're going to need... like we. I just hope that you guys all come to the realization um, before it's not too late, but before before you waste too much time, because I watch too many people um, be stubborn for years until they finally come to the realization where they have a light bulb moment where, where it's like, oh, crap, I do need partners, do I? Don't I? Uh, and it, it took me a few years, it took me a few years before I um, lost that stubborn mentality. <laughs> Um, and I realize, but it, like, it's, it's also a, a big, um, it's a big paradigm shift because it's the way that you look at it. It's not like you're begging people for money. I think that the way that you should look at it, I know we're talking about joint ventures and joint ventures, is the fifth one here, but I think it's important. The way that you look at it should be from uh, a perspective of, uh, helping people, right there. I have friends and I have family, even to this day, that's, that still have not uh, come around yet, but I have friends and I have family who have no retirement plans whatsoever. I have uh, friends and I have family who um, think they're okay, but they're not okay. And I think that if I can, if I can find a way to not, not from a selfish perspective, but if I can find a way to, to give them that aha moment that investing in real estate is going to help them, then I think it's my duty. I think it's my, because nobody else is going to, right. And they haven't come to the realization themselves. So I want to help other people. I want them to to succeed like me. I want them to build something for their family. I want them to have a good retirement. Um, and if you look at it from a perspective of helping people and educating them and guiding them, and uh, then I then I think that joint ventures aren't all that bad. But when when you first come into it and you're like, oh, I got to ask people for money, and then like, well, hang on a second, like, why would they invest with me, or like, why would they give up fifty percent of their their profits or whichever for for uh, for for my expertise? It's it's I, I get it, but just change the way you look at it, and if you change the way you look at it and the way you believe it, um, your potential joint venture partners or the people who want to invest with you, um, they will receive it differently. When you believe it differently, they will receive it differently. But if you don't believe it, if you don't believe you're worth it or you don't believe that they should, 
then that's the way they're going to receive it. They can read it off your face. They can read it off your tone, your energy, your body language. Okay, so let's get back in order and I will get back to joint ventures afterwards. Get a repeat of that in a few seconds. Yeah, maybe I'll give you a repeat, yeah. (laughs) So uh, where do you get the money to buy properties? (laughs) Uh, You can save. You could save, save, save and buy all cash which by the way is a terrible ROI. Imagine you buy that $500,000 asset, um, that that $500,000 property, and you bought it all $500,000 cash. Um, then it's, it's it's very similar to buying a stock, except for the fact that this is a business and a stock, you know, you you can't operate as a business. You can't, you can't rent a stock, right? So if you're buying all $500,000 cash, you're still getting the same return. You're still getting the same amount of rent coming in, $3,000 a month or $2,000 a month. Wouldn't you rather get $3,000 a month in rent when only putting $100,000 in as opposed to putting $500,000 in? Yeah, you're going to be paying some financing costs and everything else, but your ROI is going to be significantly higher. Remember, if you buy a $500,000 asset for $100,000, you're making five times as much. But if you buy it all cash for $500,000 and you don't leverage, remember leverage? If you don't leverage a mortgage, then you're not getting five times as much. Just think about it just as simply as in the asset appreciation, right? If you buy a $500,000 asset, it goes up in value. I would rather have $100,000 in that property than $500,000, right? Because if I have $500,000 into it, I'm, I'm, I'm missing out on leveraging the OPM. I'm missing out on five times the, the, the return. So bad ROI. So you can, uh, what we recommend is using other people's money. And there's lots of different forms of other people's money. I talked about joint ventures as numero uh, cinco uh, uh, at the end there, which we'll get back to. Uh, but mortgage financing is, is other people's money. That's a bank's money. Let's leverage the bank's money up to 80% of the purchase. And let's take advantage of that, right? It's there. It's an opportunity. Why not take it, right? All right if you're scared of money or, or borrow money, then I... Go read, um, like I said, Robert Kiyosaki's Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Go read. Um, you got to change your mindset on, on, on money, the difference between good debt and bad debt. Good debt is money that you borrow and you make money off of it. Bad debt is buying a, a, financing a boat, financing a car, buying depreciating assets, buying something that doesn't make you money every month. Good debt is buying an asset that makes you money, right? So change your change your your uh, your belief system or and, and the way you look at um, debt. Uh, it's a very important part of becoming an entrepreneur and a real estate investor. Read those books. Do lots of research on it. Now, home equity line of credit is is kind of similar to a um, mortgage financing. Um, it it is technically a mortgage. A home equity line of credit is a mortgage. Um, it's treated that way at least in 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 in, in regards to how credit works. Um, but you can say, for example, you already own your own home and you have quite a bit of equity. Maybe maybe you've uh, you got a, a mortgage for $100,000 left on your $500,000 house. So you got $400,000 worth of equity there. What you're allowed to do is you can actually access some of that equity. They will allow you to um, add another mortgage onto that property or, or to increase, you can refinance it, in, increase that mortgage amount uh, and, and borrow some of that equity out at a, at a, at a cost, at an interest rate. Um, borrow that equity. Now you can pull it out. You're going to pay interest on it, but you can use those funds, those uh, home equity line of credit funds to maybe be a down payment for your next house. So think about that. You already own a house. You have a hundred thousand dollar mortgage on it. The house is worth $500,000. You got $400,000 worth of equity here. The bank will allow you to borrow $300,000 of that up to 80%. Okay. You borrow that $300,000. You're going to pay interest on it, but you can take that $300,000 and go buy three more houses. One, two, three. Now you own four houses, all with $400,000 mortgages on them, but now you own four. So if each of those properties go up in value, would you rather own one house or would you rather own four houses? I'd rather own four houses because if the values go up. I'm, I'm going to make significantly more, right? If the value of each property goes from five hundred to $600,000, if I owned one property, I would make 100K. If I own four properties, I made 400K, all with the same amount of money. I've just, I've, I've, re, I've, I've taken those, that, that equity that I have in my first property and I've redistributed it across four properties. I've utilized OPM. I've, I've utilized the mortgages 
the bank is willing to give me all that money. The bank is willing to allow me to borrow my equity and then borrow more mortgage funds to buy all these properties, all with the same the same amount. I didn't I didn't add anything extra into it. I just redistributed those funds. I borrowed the OPM that they were allowing me, the mortgage financing that they were allowing me to borrow to get four properties now. Now I have four businesses instead of one or or my home, my home equity. Leverage, baby. I'm telling you, it's 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 real. It's absolutely real. There's so much cool stuff you can do utilizing OPM. Okay. Now there are such things uh, off topic of that. We, I think I've made my point on that. <laughs> off topic from that, there is also what's called a private mortgage. So uh, this is um, this would be something different than going to your your TD Canada Trust or your RBC or your Manulife banks, the big banks, the A lenders. What you can also do is you can borrow money from other people, um, just normal, um, you know, regular Joes who have some cash in the bank. Maybe Gabby's got some extra cash or, or maybe Gabby's pulled uh, some money out of her home equity line of credit and she wants to reinvest that. She wants to arbitrage the equity that she has in her home. Gabby's got $300,000. She's pulling out in a home equity line of credit. She's borrowing it at 5%, but she wants to lend it to me at 15%. She's going to make a 10% spread on her money. She borrowed the money from her home equity line of credit. She's lent at 5% interest. She's going to lend it to me at 15% interest. I'm going to use that money. I'm going to buy properties, right? I'm going to do, I'm going to do some creative deals with it. She makes a 10% spread on that. Pretty cool. And I get to borrow it from, from Gabby. Gabby's not TD Canada Trust. Gabby's going to do her, her same old, you know, uh, diligence. She's going to look in to see what I'm going to be doing with the property. She's going to want to make sure that I'm, I have a solid plan. What are you doing with these funds, Wayne, that you're borrowing on high interest? Well, I'm going to use these funds and I'm going to, I'm going to do fix and flip deals with them. I'm going to short, I'm going to use them for short-term, um, my short-term loans for short-term strategies like fix and flip. I'm going to buy a property. I'm going to renovate it. I'm going to fix it. I'm going to sell for profit. So utilize private mortgages as well. Normally private mortgages will be higher interest rate. I hope you guys are taking notes on this. I'm ripping through it very quickly, but private mortgages, typically short-term private mortgages are significantly higher interest rates. So they can't really be utilized for rental properties, for example. If you go back to the example of how the numbers work, can you imagine what your mortgage payment would be if it was on a 15% interest rate? It's going to be ridiculous. You won't be able to, to find a property that will be able to, uh, where the rents will be high enough to be able to make sure that a cash flow is on a high interest loan. High interest private mortgages are, are typically used for short-term financing for more creative strategies. But it is definitely a, a way that you, something that you can leverage um, other people's money um, on to, 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 to create profit. Credit cards. You can't use credit cards for down payments. <laughs> um, you can't use credit cards uh, to... Credit cards are, it is it is a form of, of OPM. It is other people's money. It is the bank's money. Credit cards can be utilized for the example that I just gave you a minute ago. It can be utilized for renovations. So if you're doing a fix and flip project, and you know now I've, I've borrowed Gabby's $300,000 um, on the private loan to buy the property that I want to fix and flip, but I don't have any money for renovations. I can use the bank's credit card and borrow money on the credit card to pay for the renovations. OPM, right? I can pay for the renovations on the credit card. And then in four months when I sell the property, I take the money from the, that I get back. I pay off my credit card. I pay off Gabby. And then there's a nice chunk of profit there afterwards. I don't even need any money to do a fix and flip. I borrowed Gabby's money. I borrowed the money for the, for the purchase. I borrowed the money off my credit card for the renovation costs. And as long as I've got enough of a spread there, you got to take into consideration all of this comes at a very high cost. The financing costs and the borrowing costs are going to be significantly higher. We're talking about 15% interest rates. But if I can find a really good deal or a wholesaler finds me a really good deal or a realtor finds me a really good deal where I can buy it for a price, I can pay for all the financing, high interest financing costs from Gabby's mortgage. I can pay for all the high interest financing costs from the credit card for the renovations. And there's still profit to be made afterwards. That's a great way to get into real estate with none of your own money. So credit cards can be leveraged as well. Just make sure you understand how credit cards work, how the interest works, uh, grace periods. You got to do a lot of research into, into credit cards and really truly understand them, how to utilize um, offers that credit card companies offer as well. 
if you understand how it all works and how it all uh, how the costs work, there's a great opportunity to leverage that as well to buy properties. And then lastly, we talked about joint ventures. <laughs> Um, so Wayne, there's, um, <clears throat> excuse me, there's some questions coming in with a little bit of confusion about um, qualifying for um, the mortgages, if you're say borrowing from HELOC um, and, and utilizing your home equity and that sort of thing. Um, just timing wise, I don't think we have time to really dive into that. And I want to stay on topic here. Um, go you ahead. Know, you know, um... We're given, we're given, um, we're given boot. It's, 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 I, there's only so much we can teach today in this boot camp. And a boot camp is like, think of like, you know, you're, you're, you're joining the armed forces. They, they, a boot camp is, is like a, a quick, we got to get you up to speed type thing. Um, that's why we call it that. And as much as I'd like to answer all the questions, uh, I, we have to kind of stay on track. So we do offer free coaching Monday through Friday at 6 a.m. Mountain time. And I, I, I want you guys to utilize that. That's a resource. That's something that we provide for you guys. So that we, we want to be able to provide free coaching. We want to be able to provide free education. Um, so for those ones, I would highly recommend you save it for that. If you can't make the live show, um, I'll just tell you, email us at info at reimorningshow.com and say, hey, can you answer this question on the show? And then you can listen to it afterwards. Um, if you email me, sometimes if I remember, I'll email you back and say, hey, I answered your question on this morning on the show. Um, just go listen to that show. Um, we'll be able to answer that. But th th that's, that's great questions um, about, you know, how do I qualify for a mortgage when I'm borrowing, you know, the the HELOC? Uh, I'm sorry, I'm borrowing the down payment on the HELOC. Because when you borrow the down payment from a, your home equity line of credit, you're going to be paying, say, 5%, 7% interest on that. And that that cost will get added into um, your overall um, formula for you qualifying for that new property because what they're going to want is you're they're going to want to know that you're able to service that debt that you've now created you borrow more debt for the down payment they want to make sure that you have enough money coming in from your 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 salary or your income or from the property the uh, cash flow from the property that you're buying in order to service the $300 interest payment that you have to pay on that down payment money or $500 interest payments. So it's a terrific question. Um what I'd recommend doing is I know that there's a mortgage broker here today um or call your investor focused mortgage broker and ask them how do I go about doing this? If I want to borrow money from a HELOC, will I be able to qualify for this property? That's what an investor focused mortgage broker is going to be able to help you out with. They're going to be able to tell you Hey, yeah, it's great. I know you can use it, but you're going to need to pay off your truck a little bit to lower some of your debt payments so that you qualify for all of this. There is a lot to consider when you are planning um, building on rent, building a rental portfolio. It's so incredibly complicated, and I could do a whole eight-hour workshop on it. In yeah. fact, we've done an eight-hour workshop or a four-hour workshop on it um, with Keaton Kirkwood. Uh, he's an investor-focused mortgage broker. We had him... Um, come in for a full workshop with us on um, uh, up through the REI master's mentorship program. And um, it's, it's in the master's vault um, about how to go about doing that, how to plan to get the most mortgages. It is so incredibly complicated. And I, um, as much as I try and keep up the rules constantly change. So you have to stay on top of it and you have to make sure you have the right um, mortgage broker on your power team. Okay. Yeah. And uh, one other thing, uh, Wayne, maybe in the chat, you can put um, the email if people have questions that they want us to answer on the show. Can you just type it into the chat? Um, you betcha. So that. And then in. I'll just add, because there was another question, and I'm just going to give a really simple answer, but I want people to understand that, um, you know, when you get your first rental property, it's about, you know, like how much money are you making? Are you servicing the debt that you currently have? And can you kind of like support what you're looking to do? But as one thing that they that is a major consideration is with a rental property is that they want to know that the rent that you're bringing in is going to cover the expenses that you are now incurring holding this property. And so there's this calculation that comes into play where they say, OK, this property is going to service itself. You're going to be bringing in enough rent that it's going to be a well-oiled business machine. And that's kind of how they do it. And then when you add properties to that, so there was a question about like, but if you get four more, then you're going to have these other $2,000 mortgages. Do they want you to show that much more income that you have personally? No, they want to well, make sure- Well, the income is going to come from the rental. 
is the, going to come from the, the tenants. Coming from the rental, from the tenants is going to be covering that. So yeah. that's how you continue to get qualified is that you are not buying negative cash flowing properties that can't support themselves. You're buying for cash flow. You're mitigating. Cash flow. <laughs> yeah. It's not just a risk mitigator. It's also how you support all of the new financing that you're borrowing, all yeah. of the new debt. Your cash flow is actually going to help you. The rent, the, the rental income is going to offset the expenses on that property. The additional cash flow is actually going to help you support the rest of the portfolio as well. They take that into consideration. And if you're not buying cash flowing properties, you will not qualify for new mortgages. Yeah. It's uh, mortgage financing. We talked about uh, building a roadmap, building your roadmap towards your goals and how to strategies. You also need a roadmap for your mortgages as well. I, I can't even help you with that. I, I've tried. I have tried to become a mortgage expert. Every time I get close, they change the gosh darn rules. It's And it's not just all mortgage companies. Each individual mortgage company has their own rules, their own formulas, and they change with the weather. So you're wondering, how many mortgages can I get? As long as I buy cash flowing properties, can I get as many as I want? Some lenders will allow you to. Some lenders only allow you four. Some lenders only allow you four with them. Some lenders say you can have three with us, but four total with, uh, with all the mortgages. It's some of them want you to, uh, uh, to, to, they will give you a 30 year amortization, uh, which means a loan that you pay off over 30 years. Some of them will say you have to pay it off over 25 years. Some of them want you to put 20% down. Some of them want you to put 25% down. Every single lender has their own individual rules. And then they have the rules that, that, that are, that they're required to follow as per CMHC. It's, absolutely it's so complicated and it's so important uh, we we only i was i was very general earlier about having the right investor focused you know professionals in your team if you don't have the right investor focused mortgage broker who understands how investment real estate works you they're going to get you that they're, what they're going to do is they're going to shop you around and they're going to get you the cheapest interest rate they're going to get you the lowest payment because that's what they think you want. But by doing that strategy, you are shooting yourself in the foot for your next mortgage because you went with a lender that allows this, but you've shot yourself in the foot because when you need to go to a new lender over here, they're going to be like, oh yeah, we don't, I can't give you any more because you've already got four mortgages. You see what I mean? If you can be very strategic and know which lenders to use first. And though you may be paying a higher interest rate, whatever, but if you use the right lenders first, you can actually get more mortgages, but you have to be extremely strategic. So hopefully okay. that helps. Hopefully that helps. I, 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 I can't stress that enough. <laughs> every, every freaking real estate investor makes this mistake. They're like, oh, I just went with the cheapest one. Yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm just going to, I think I'm going to buy a couple and then I'll get, my, then I'll talk to that guy later or that girl later. And then you go and eventually trying to get your fourth or fifth mortgage. And they're like, no, sorry, I can't help you. Not unless you sell those properties first. It's, it's, it's the worst. Hey, Wayne, I'm going to reel it in here and get on to, okay. we're going to be diving into um, yeah. joint ventures. So we're going to get a little bit deeper into joint venture partnerships. Um, I know that it's a, a big topic um, with lots to cover. And it looks like we're in our final hour here. So okay. we're going to keep it, keep it to uh, what we have on the, on the screen here. And if you guys do have other questions, Wayne, put that email in there and we would love to answer all of your questions um, throughout the week next week. Keep us Absolutely. busy. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So what is a joint venture? Um, also commonly called JV. So if you hear people saying JV, JV, they're talking about joint ventures. So a joint venture partnership is when two or more investors combine their resources to purchase an investment. And <clears throat> traditionally, there will be a money partner and a working partner, each taking a 50% claim in the profits. So really, it's just like the combining, the pooling of resources. So maybe somebody has um, expertise, but they don't have any money. Maybe somebody has, um, you know, ca can or can't qualify for a mortgage. Maybe somebody, you know, like there's there's all these different resources that come into that are required to purchase a property. So if you have a part of the puzzle piece, but not the the rest of them, and you can't quite form the full thing to to get the property, you can find other people who possess those resources to come together and uh, make that whole to get that property. Yeah. Okay. So uh, we talked about the money partner. So traditionally, uh, that money partner will bring the money and qualify for the mortgage. 
So one thing I want to say about about joint venture partnerships is that um, we're going to be kind of talking about the the usual kind of like what's the most common the standard the standard thing that you'll see. But the thing to know about joint ventures is that they can be whatever you want them to be. So whatever works for you and for the other partner or the other partners, you can put that into a contract and that can be what works for you guys. And it doesn't need to be this typical way. Um, but we're, what we're going to be covering is kind of what you would normally see. So that's the 50, 50 with the money partner and the working partner. Okay. So that money partner, like I said, is bringing the money and they're getting qualified for the mortgage. And then on the other side of that deal, we have the working partner. So that's traditionally the expert, the person who's got the education, they have the power team of the kick-ass investor-focused realtor, the insanely smart investor-focused mortgage broker. Um, you have that badass lawyer closing deals for you left, right, and center. You got <laughs> you got that power team just like hyped up. You got it nailed down. It's awesome. Okay. The accountant, so, accountant the contractor. Everything the home inspector, you got the whole, the whole, the whole team. Yeah. Um, if you want to be a working partner, how many of you guys show of hands? Um, I can't see everybody's face, but like show of hands or, or put in the comments. How many of you guys want to be a working partner and you want to raise capital from somebody else? You want to use other people's money? Fairly certain. I'm going to see about 90% of your hands come up, right? If you want to be that type of person, you got to become that type of person. So you got to build that team. You got to become an expert. You have to get lots of education. You have to know everything about everything. You need to be able to have an answer to every possible problem, right? You also need to have, you also need to know how to manage a deal. You know how to find deals so you can have a power team that can find them, or you could be the type of expert who knows where to find them. You know the unique opportunities in your market and you want to share them with people, but they're willing to invest in you and your expertise and your resources. You need to become a resourceful person and your resources. They're willing to invest in you and give you half of the profits because they know you're going to make money. You know the best part about being a working partner? It's my favorite line. It's my favorite line. When people ask, well, why would I give you 50%? That's a very good point. You know, the best part about it is the fact that if I'm taking 50% of the profits and you're taking 50% of the profits, then this deal has to make money. Am I right? Because if this deal doesn't make any money, then I don't make any money. So I am inclined. I have an equitable interest in this success of this deal. I only, you only, I only make money if you make money. And I do not work for free. I like my life. So I like, I like my life. I like my personal time. If I'm going to put time into this, I want to make sure that I'm going to make as much money as possible. So I am, I am motivated to make sure this deal makes as much money as possible because I only make money if you make money. So shouldn't that, shouldn't that be a good enough reason right there? And to be honest, the money partner doesn't typically have that level of that expertise. They don't have the power team. They don't know where to invest. They don't know the unique opportunities. They don't know what to do when things go sideways. But I got the answers to everything. And I've got the team and the expertise and the experience. So it's better to have half the pie and then to um, fill in the blank. Yeah. <laughs> <Wish I had. laughs> then to have none, right? Yeah, because none. truthfully, the money partners, they'll, they'll say, like, uh, and then they'll never buy anything. So wouldn't you rather have half than nothing? Yeah. And that's the thing without the, without the expertise, without the education and being able to find the right deal and bringing, like I said, that power team and also managing the deal, whether that be, you know, like ma managing um, a property manager or a construction team or the property itself, if you want to self-manage um, all of that, it's easy for somebody to say, well, why wouldn't I just do it myself? But when they haven't put the, when they haven't invested in the education and the learning and, um, and just the experience, they haven't been through any of it. Um, it's easier said than done. Why wouldn't I just do it myself? Easier yeah. said than done. Yeah. And, and, and we're going to be going through um, who we're allowed to joint venture with. We're going to be going through why would someone invest with you? We're also going to be going through um, how to attract people towards you and how to be, how to become that expert today. I'm just going to say this before we get into this. We're going to be actually, I'm I'm actually quite surprised on how much we're going into as far as joint venturing and branding today and becoming an expert and being known as an expert. We're going through quite a bit. 
but I do not, I, I just, as a reminder, uh, what I said before lunch, this is not enough education in order for you to go out and do it. You are going to need to take a course on raising capital or joint ventures, please, please. Cause I want to make sure, uh, for two reasons. One, uh, I know for a fact that there is much more that I could be teaching you than I'm leaving out today. And I also, I want to make sure that you stay out of the gray area. There's a lot of gray area in this in, in regards to, I'm going to, uh, in regards to securities laws, every province has their own law for, for how securities are to be handled. So I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to share with you who you're allowed to join venture with, but I want you to really truly understand the ins and outs of it because I've seen too many people, too many people over the last decade get burned or too many people who are uneducated, who are raising capital and not doing it properly and getting in a lot of trouble. So please make sure that you take a joint venture course or a raising capital course, a reputable one. If you need recommendations, just send us an email and I can help you out with that. Um, Barry McGuire is, uh, is my, is my, my go-to for every uh, creative real estate strategy. Barry McGuire is one of the OGs of creative real estate education. Um, it's where we got all of our information from. It's actually the education that we provide in our mentorship program. We actually provide their education because it's so good. Um, real, uh, Barry McGuire is a real estate lawyer in Edmonton. He's been, uh, he's been a real estate lawyer for uh, close to or over 50 years. And he's been teaching real estate investing strategies for 15 years. He's the OG. Take their courses, please. If you're, um, um, I highly recommend it. Stay out of the gray area. But let's um, get into it. Let's. I, I, I'm excited to share because this is this is this is super valuable stuff. Yeah. When we're talking about joint venture partners, I just really love this quote. It's individually we are one drop. Together we are an ocean. And it's just, I, ju I just think like this applies to so many areas in life, but you know, like you can either try go at it alone and see how far you get, or you can, you know, come together and, and get so much further. So speak so true to joint venture partnerships. Yeah. Cause it's not always just about money too. Sometimes it's about at levels of expertise, right? Sometimes um, you might partner with someone because they have some experience as a contractor. Maybe you partner with them because they have more experience uh, in, a, in a particular market that you want to learn about, or there's so many more pieces to a joint venture puzzle than just money expert. Um, Gabby said, we're going over the standard like 50, 50 uh, rental property joint venture today, but you can make a joint venture into whatever you want. You can have someone who does this, somebody who does this, somebody who does this, and you can determine how much of the deal they get Maybe it's not 50-50, it's 75-25, whichever else. So um, there's a lot more to it. And, you know, utilizing joint ventures is a great way to get ahead rather than trying to do it on your own, right? So why is a joint venture partner so important? And um, we've highlighted some of the main reasons that we really see um, it as an important tool. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go over the, the two that I enjoy and I'm going to let Wayne... Well, I like them all. <laughs> Can you give me the crappy ones? Is that what you're saying? No, no, no. Okay. But um, the the one that I um that really changed my mindset on joint venture partnerships was the helping others, and I think that at some point when when we're taught about joint ventures and how we can get further with joint venture partners, we think like we think that it's all just for us. It's to move us forward. It's because we need to, oh shoot, we can't get any more mortgages. Now we need joint venture partners. Okay, we got to start figuring out how we're going to get people to trust us. But if we shift our mindset into a helping others and that it's not just you that's benefiting from this, you are helping somebody else build wealth and get a retirement plan in place. And, you know, like all these benefits that you are reaping, they are also reaping. And so it's, if we can shift that mindset, all of a sudden joint venture partnerships are, and you know, when you're talking to people, it's less about like, okay, I need them. And it's more about like, wow, this week, this could be a real big win-win. We can help each other out in a massive way here. Right. So I love the helping others aspect of it. And also as Wayne just kind of like went over a little bit more was tapping into other people's skill sets. So it doesn't just need to be money money partner and working partner who has all the expertise. It could be that maybe you want to do um, fix and flips, but you know you've never even you've never swung a hammer and you don't even know how to start with contractors and that sort of thing. Um, you know, like you said, maybe you partner with a with a contractor, somebody who has that experience, yeah. and maybe it's you bringing the money. Um, but they're bringing, and you know, like you've, you've done all the courses on fix and flips and you understand how to run the math, you know, how to find a good deal, but you just need somebody with some construction background to, to bring in. So tap or into someone who's done fix and flips before. Yeah. 
Yeah. So, you know, you might think of yourself as the expert, but that doesn't always mean that you don't have any money in it or that you don't, you know, there's, there's so many ways to structure it. So really tapping into those skill sets. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, me as a, as a, as an entrepreneur, I think scalability, how can I, how can I turn this business into what is the potential of this business? You know, if I look at what is the scalability of this business with just me and my financing or just me and my time, um, I'm going to hit the ceiling pretty quickly. You know what I mean? I, I can't take this much bigger or much higher. But if I leverage other people's money and I leverage other people's skills and I leverage um, just other people in general, I have significantly more resources and the sky's the limit. You know what I mean? There's so much more I can do. If you think about it, actually, you have an endless opportunity. If you were to, to continue to keep utilizing joint venture partners and their ability to, to get mortgages and their financing and their ability to get more money and stuff like that, just the, the possibilities are endless. It really just comes down to how much you, you can manage as an individual um, in regards to, you know, the, the business administration side of it or the managing the partners and stuff like that. But scalability, like it's uh, the opportunities are, are, are endless. So I love that. I love the endless opportunities. I love to be able to, to take this as far as I want. It helps me dream bigger. Seriously, if you thought about it, it was just as you and what, how many mortgages can I get? Or am I going to get capped out at three mortgages? Or how do I get the most? Or how much money can I save? You know, you're, you're probably dreaming very small when you originally looked at this, when you originally read that first book or originally, you know, thought about real estate. I'm like, oh, wow, 90% of millionaires all became rich in real estate. Oh, yeah, I bet you I could buy three. You're probably dreaming very, very small. But when you think about this and think about leveraging other people's money and other people and stuff like that, you can suddenly start dreaming significantly bigger. And I, I that's that's one of the best parts about being a real estate investing coach as well, is I get to see those light bulbs coming on when people realize, holy shit. Sorry for swearing, but seriously, holy shit. Like I can do anything. I could, I could, this could get so much bigger. And that's what I love about it. I just as an entrepreneur, as a, as a and, and um just as an individual as well. I, I think the scalability portion is my my absolute favorite. Because I'm always thinking as, a, as an entrepreneur, like any business that I start, what's the ceiling based on um, uh, the possible clients, um, based on um, how much access to you know, service or products, how much time do we have? Um, what's the demand? What's, what's the biggest I can take this business and how do I build backwards from that? Um, I, I, I love analyzing it from that perspective. I talked about financing very briefly when I was explaining that mortgages is the other one. Um, is that you will get capped on mortgages. Um, that's normally when people come to that realization that I was talking about earlier. We all come to that realization we're going to need joint venture partners eventually. Even if you've got you've got three million dollars in the bank account, you're or or three million dollars where the joint venture partners and they're investing with you, but they're not carrying the financing. You're going to eventually realize that oh crap, we are going to hit a ceiling. We are going to hit a roadblock on mortgages eventually. Doesn't matter how good the cash flow is. If each individual lender has their own individual rules about how many mortgages you can have with each of them, um, you will reach um, the ceiling eventually. Uh, but, but that doesn't mean you can't get more mortgages. I, again, I, I could I could talk eight hours about mortgages and financing, and I I still wouldn't even be able to because I'm not a mortgage um, a broker or specialist, but. That doesn't mean you can't keep getting mortgages. What you're also going to notice is when you reach a certain amount of mortgages, you can go to like B lenders and alternative lenders and stuff like that. But you're going to start to notice the terms are not as good as what you were getting at CIBC, RBC, um, whatever, TD, like all your big banks. You're going to start to notice the interest rates are going to get higher. You're going to start to notice that the terms are going to get worse. There's smaller amortization or loan periods. You're going to be noticing that they're going to want more of your equity or down payment. And it's just suddenly the deals aren't going to make sense anymore. We're going to have the exact same cookie cutter deals that you've been normally doing, but the financing terms are are just it's going to make the cash flow less. It's going to it's going to it's not going to make those deals as as good as what they used to be. So, um, yes, you can get more mortgages. You can go through you know credit unions and private lenders and stuff like that. You can make it work. But uh, personally, I would rather leverage my joint venture partners who only have one or two mortgages where they can get access to that really good funding, those low interest rates, those good financing terms, where we can still have good cash flowing properties. I'll take half of it. I don't care. Um, but I'd rather get better cash flowing deals and, and better ROI by leveraging and utilizing the joint venture partners within my network. So mortgages, yeah, that, that's why 
joint venture partners. It's not just about the money. Sometimes it's actually about the financing and the 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 their ability to access that financing that we no longer have access to. Hey, this is a big one. So who are we allowed to joint venture with? Um, this is a really, really important slide that um, if this is new to anybody, I want you to pay attention, maybe screenshot it and, and remind yourself that this is something that you need to look into um, because this is uh, really regulated by the Securities Commission of whatever province you're in, but it's pretty standard um, Canada-wide that um, rules that you need to follow. If you're curious, just look up securities law, whatever province you're in, yeah, and and go through it. Um, please, uh, please do. And uh, the other one you're gonna want to look into while we're on the topic, uh, it's not on the topic of joint ventures, is uh, look up your uh, your real estate laws of of your province as well. Um, that's gonna tell you what you're allowed to do as a joint venture partner. Um, and that is relevant because um, you can't property manage. I know this is off topic, Gabby, but uh, you're not allowed to manage a property that you don't have an equitable interest in. So if you're thinking, oh, wow, okay, I'm just going to, I'm just going to manage my friend's property for them. Well, just know that that actually goes against the the real estate laws of your province. Um, you have to have a license in order to manage a property. So um, you need to have an equitable interest in the property, means which can be a joint venture. Um, and then as well, who you can joint venture with or who you can advertise investment opportunities with is listed right here. This is generally speaking, but I, I, I please I implore you to look up your local, uh, your provincial security laws to make sure that you're staying out of the gray area, please. Yes. So um, basically, okay, so we can joint venture with friends and family, um, no problem. And then we get into accredited investors. And I'm well, I'm going to quickly go through this, and then we're going to talk about why this is a thing. Okay, so friends, friends and family, there's no problems. Um, they're known to you. You can go ahead and get into a partnership with them without any issues because um, they know you, and and you're not some random person. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and then there's also accredited investors. So the definition of an accredited in investor is an individual alone or with a spouse who has a net uh, who has net assets of more than five million dollars an individual who has a before tax income of over 200,000 for at least 2 years in a row and expects to exceed that income the current calendar year and a person registered in Canada under the securities legislation as a dealer or advisor so when we look at this as a whole what we see here is that you can you can joint venture with accredited investors because they know how to make money they know how to manage their money. They're they're money savvy. Let's call it. Okay. So they're they're not somebody who's at risk of being like, oh, somebody said that if I give them, you know, uh, eighty thousand dollars and buy this property, that they're going to give me this kind of return. And not really. It's, it seems pretty good. So I think I'm just going to do it. No, they understand investing. They understand what's going on. They understand how to manage their money. And so if we look at that on the flip side with friends and family, they know you, they trust you, they, they're, it's not like you're going up to a stranger on the street and, and trying to pitch them an opportunity. Okay. So that's kind of like the big picture of why this all comes into play. You're not, tr and like, and so, sorry, as you can see, I'm kind of holding back a little bit because <laughs> I don't want to go too far, but there's lots of people with within this community of of real estate investors in Canada and in each of our um, communities, you'll see them who are are just kind of like putting these opportunities out and then being like, yeah, I'll hop on a phone call with you and talk about this opportunity, and then they're perceived to the other person to be some sort of expert, and maybe they've told them, oh yeah, I've done lots of fix and flips, or yeah, I've done this, oh yeah, yeah, I've been investing for a decade, and they're just spitting out stuff to gain trust that isn't true but the person doesn't know them. They're not an accredited, investor, accredited investor, so they don't know about all of the background checks that they should be doing on this person. They just think, oh, wow, they've been, do they've been doing this for a decade? And oh, ma, they said that they did like 10 fix and flips. That's so cool. Okay, I definitely want to get into this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, here's my money. 
Meanwhile, that person's a scammer. They've lost a whole bunch of people's money already. And now they're trying to get your money to pay off them. And then they'll figure out how they're going to maybe pay you in the future, but they're probably not. So do you see how and why this is regulated? It's to protect people yes. because it's so easy to get caught up in an opportunity and think that there's this really great opportunity to make money and to get screwed over. You know what I really want to say? Yeah. Securities laws are there to protect the public. That's why they're there. And it's uh, securities laws are actually kind of um, more so built around just, you know, um, to avoid people from offering um, investment opportunities, not necessarily for real estate investing. If you look in there, there's not a whole, there's, there's, there's not a whole lot of reference to real estate investing. Um, to be completely honest with you, I've said this a lot. Um, the fact that it's kind of the wild, wild west with investment, like real estate investment opportunities, and they're not really referenced is actually shocks me. And the more and more we hear about these horrible stories about people getting screwed over and people um, not or going in the gray area or not following the securities laws, the more likely they're going to be shining a big light on this industry. So we do have an opportunity to work with friends and family. I, I don't, me personally, I don't think it's going to be around forever. I think that this is something that we're going to look back on decades from now and be like, oh God, I, that was really good when we could. So make, I, I always, I, I'm trying to, to educate people on this because I, whether you do or don't doesn't affect my life, but it kind of does a little bit because if, if you're messing around like everybody else is and more I keep hearing more horror stories and bad stories. A, a light's going to be sh uh, um, shined on it or shone on it, and th things are going to change, and that's going to affect us, and it's going to affect our ability to be able to for the people that are doing it right to be able to continue to grow our business and our portfolios and help other individuals and build a better life for ourselves. So do it right, because if not, you're going to root for yourself and ruin it for everybody else. Now, um, if you want to trade securities or you want to offer investment opportunities, uh, it's it's worded a little in. A uh, little off here, but the third one there is you need to be a person registered in Canada under the securities legislation as a dealer or advisor. So you need to get a, you need to get registered. You need to get education. You need to know how to do it properly. So if you aren't, then you have those are the the, the two options, three options that you have. You can offer investment opportunities to your friends and to your family, people that know and and trust you, or you can offer an opportunity to an accredited investor and an accredited investor. But like the simple definition of it is, is that someone who knows how to uh, use their money, the government of Canada or, or the, the securities commission just assumes that if you're making $200,000 a year for at least two years in a row, or you've got a net worth of $5 million worth of assets, you clearly know how to operate, like to use money. That's it. They're like, this person clearly understands how to make money and not lose it. So someone who's savvy enough to, to be like, okay, um, yeah, th that is definitely a good opportunity. But for the for the for everyone else who doesn't fit that criteria, they assume that they're not educated and that they're they could potentially be naive and a fast talking real estate investor. And I got an opportunity for you to double your money in four years or your money back in six months uh, with a fifty percent return. Fast talking, you know, real estate investor, fast talking, you know, in, investment advisor or whatever, uh, can can probably, you know, manipulate someone into into something that maybe they don't know much about. So Securities Commission is trying to prevent that from happening. So, well, here's my recommendation. Um, if I could, I would cross out the credit investors right now. And my recommendation to you is just talk to your friends and family. There is more. I don't know if this is on a slide ahead of us, but there is more than enough money and opportunity in your immediate circle of friends and family than you need. All you need is a good four or five joint venture partners. And that could be your aunt, that could be your cousin, that could be the guy you play hockey with, that could be the um, your your girlfriend from, um, uh, your old friend from, uh, from high school or whichever else. Like there's more than enough there. There's more than enough people have a little bit of equity in their home that, that want to get into investing, but they don't know how and they don't have the time to. Find someone who wants to invest in real estate that just doesn't have the time or the energy or the know-how to do it. And they're willing to, you know, to, to trust you to do it for them. That's all you need, four or five. Think about it. If you had four or five, you did that this year. And in five years from now, you built up enough equity that you could pull a HELOC on each of those properties, right? Let's say, for example, I'm going to give you a really basic example here. I, I don't want to go too far into it. Let's say, for example, you buy, uh, you have five joint venture partners this year, you buy five properties right? 
And in five years from now, the values of those properties go up and the mortgages go down and there's enough equity in there. And now you can pull a HELOC on all five of those properties. And that HELOC, you can pull up enough to get down payments for five more properties. In five years from now, you had five, you pull the, the money off the HELOCs and you buy five more. Now you have 10. Five years after that, what are you going to do? You're going to pay down the mortgages, value of the property is going to increase. And now you have 10 more HELOCs for 10 more down payments. Now you have 20 properties in 10 years. See how this can like, how you can leverage this and how the, the equity it, it just compounds, how you can compound everything and you can just have so much more so quickly. I know some of you are like, oh, it doesn't pay down enough or doesn't go well. What if the values don't go up? Like, I'm just showing you the opportunities that are possible because that each of those five original joint venture partners, they might have enough for two properties, right? And then you get 10 properties. You don't need that much. And you don't need to look for multimillionaires who have all this money they're going to invest with you because truthfully, I mean, they, 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 they probably know more than you do anyways for the most for the most of us that are just like, normal folks who are just trying to build something more and you know your, your average mechanic or your average nurse or your average physiotherapist or your average warehouse worker who has the knowledge i'm just saying that like the, the credit investors they're going to be looking for a little bit more from you so just focus on your friends and family there's more than enough there i promise you our joint venture partners are just friends and family and to be completely honest i never ever ever would have expected any of them to ever partner with me I'm shocked at the people that partner with me. I'm like, I would have never expected that. Just coworkers, guys you play hockey with, friends of friends that you met, aunts, mothers, mother-in-laws, dads. You know what I mean? It's If you can project and present yourself as someone who knows that what they're talking about and someone who knows... Someone that can be trusted, I promise you, I promise you, they'll invest with you because they like you. These are already people that that know you, that like you, that love you, that trust you. All you got to do is just show them that you're that that you're capable. And this is, you know, obviously, you know, segueing into our next slide was why would someone invest with you? Um, I always love this one. <laughs> it's my favorite. <laughs> Who are you? Are you Keg Stan Kenny or are you respectable Randy? Um, it, are well, you the Sorry, I just, um, I, I just, yes, you can keep going, but I want to reel you in just a little bit because we're just half hour out. So half an hour. Yeah. Okay. Well, Kickstand Candy is a really good example. So uh, on your social media, you know, um, what does your profile picture look like? Is it you upside down on top of a keg? Are you Kickstand Candy, or are you respectable Randy? Do you have a a professional business um uh, picture? You know, you got the professional photos done. How are you, how are you presenting yourself? How are you showing up in life? Look in the mirror. Would you invest with yourself? Would you invest in you? Be honest. Have a good look. There's nothing wrong with it. All like none of us expected to be professional investors. You know, we we weren't expecting this in high school, right? And so you might have to clean up those old keg stand photos. Yeah, I got some old ones. Me like passed out drunk on a you know, in a hotel or whatever else. Like, oh, I got dumb photos. We're all dumb teenagers. We're all dumb 20-year-olds and we're all dumb 30-year-olds, depending on how old you are. You're never really expecting to have to present yourself like this. You were just good old fun, Kenny. And it, 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 it is what it is. So, but like, how are you showing up at school? Like the school drop-off, the grocery store, your friend's house, family gatherings. You might have to take a really good look at yourself and just think, okay, you know what? It's about time I clean myself up. And I, I, I need to present myself as the type of person that people can trust. The, the type of person that someone's willing to give $100,000 with their equity or their savings or their RRSPs to. Um, because uh, though you are who you are and everybody loves you, uh, at the end of the day, you, like you are going to need how you look, to, unfortunately, how you look and how you talk uh, matters. Because you know who you are and you know your morals, you know your values and you know, like, you know who you are and that you can be trusted. But if you're not showing up like that, you don't get to choose how people perceive you. You don't. You do not get to choose how you are perceived. How you are perceived by others is determined by them. And every person perceives you differently. So put your best foot forward and make sure that you are giving yourself the best opportunity. You're giving yourself the best um, 
uh, possibility of being perceived the way that you want to be perceived for who you are as an individual. I'm not trying to tell you to, to fake it till you make it and uh, your business photo is going to help you out or your business cards or your cool looking business name is going to work. You you want people to know you for who you are. Put your best foot forward. And then obviously when you do reach out and you grab their hand and you shake them, uh, shake their hand and and you talk to them, then they can get to know you for who you are. But first impressions are a bitch. First impressions are very important. I I promise you, I, if I could show up in jeans and a sweater every day, I would. If I could wear a hat every day, I would. <laughs> I promise you, if I could not shave every day, I would. Uh, I I work from home. I don't like. I don't want to do any of that stuff. I want to be myself. I want to just be comfortable. But unfortunately, first impressions are important. So you got to make sure that you're putting your best foot forward. I'll let you continue and get us real run me back in, Gab. No, it's good. I think that I think that you were tiptoeing around it, but I think there's a difference between, um, you know, uh, showing up and pretending to be somebody that you're not versus showing up authentically. And, um, you know, we're not saying, you know, go put on a suit to show up for your Christmas dinner next weekend. Um, that's not what we're saying. But maybe, you know, you can clean up those, you know, torn up sweatpants that you were thinking about wearing. You know what I mean? Baby steps. <laughs> you mean the tur turkey pants? Turkey pants. Yeah. Baby turkey steps. <laughs> and start to show people that you're taking, you know, this seriously. And maybe that is how you showed up was in ripped up sweatpants and a raggedy old t-shirt because it's, it's just my family, whatever. They, that's, a, that's how they know me. It's just who I am. I'm but, here for the stuffing. Yeah. But, sh but just, Stepping it up a little bit and just showing up and showing people that you're taking something seriously can really shift their perspective or not their perspective, their outlook on um, who you are and, and the seriousness of what it is, your, whatever your endeavors are. Especially your family, because they've already received a first impression many a times. Um, yeah. They've seen the dumb shit you've done. They've, you know, you've made an ass of yourself at the family reunion. Um, you're constantly getting in political arguments with your uncle. Like, unfortunately, family and friends are, are the ones that you kind of have to, you really have to put a lot of work into sh uh, changing the, the way that they're perceiving you because you've probably already done a lot of damage or they probably already, whether it be damage or just who you are, um, they already have their preconceived um, or they're, 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 they've already, they already have their first impression of you and they're tough ones to change. But, you know, um, when you're meeting new people, like at the school drop off the grocery store, you're, you know, other things like that. Um, as you meet new people, first impressions can be earned. They can be gained. So you have an opportunity to get that good first impression. Trying to change how your friends and family and, and, and other people who've already met you, how, how they perceive you is a tough one. But that's done every day, one step at a time, right? And um, it can be done. And you, my, my dad did not want to invest with me uh, out of the gate. He still saw me as his little kid. You know what I mean? And he's like, Oh, this is just like that clown business you wanted to start when you were seven. I'm like, what? <laughs> like, give me a break. I'm, I'm 24 years old. <laughs> it's been, it's been a few years. He's like, I don't know. Well, how about you just go get a little experience first and then we'll talk. So like, he already had his impression of me. He saw me well, like, you know, when I was a kid and he was changing my diaper, it's a tough one to change. It's a tough one for your aunt to change, you know, your, your, your friends who you who did all those, you know, stupid shit with in high school and whatnot. It's a, it's a tough one, but one step at a time every day, just proving to them that you're the type of person that can be trusted. So there's this um, saying that I love, so I keep it in here. Um, you are your brand. Your smile is your logo. Your personality is your business card and how you leave others feeling after an interaction becomes your trademark. So really being conscious about how you're showing up and how you're presenting yourself to people um, is is really how you'll, you're you going to be perceived. So leave them with a good impression. Yeah, absolutely. And audit yourself. So like Wayne said earlier, you know, what's your profile pictures? If it's cakes and Kenny up there upside down on the keg, um, maybe you want to clean up, clean up your social media a little bit. Um, if it's, you know, might be your actual appearance that you need to audit, you know, maybe you've kind of uh, let that hair and, and beard get out of control because you've just been like at home chilling playing video games and now you want to get out networking you might want to go get a haircut trim yeah. up <laughs> yeah and <laughs> I think this is a really good opportunity for maybe a little bit of homework for tonight if you, um, I, we hope that you guys are all coming back tomorrow we got lots of value for tomorrow um but maybe this is a little bit of homework we can share with you guys to, to, to audit yourself 
go out at your profiles, go out at um, your your closet, um, and 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 just look at yourself in the mirror and think about okay, like what can I do right now that I can change to make myself more respectable, to make myself more trustable, and um, and come back tomorrow and, and and feel free to let us know in the comments what you came up with, right? What what are you posting? Do you have some questionable posts? about your opinions on different things. How is that going to affect the people that your prospects for joint ventures? Are they going to like seeing that? Maybe can you keep it to yourself or within, you know, closer circles and and maybe just with people who want to have those discussions. So you're not, you're not um you're not offending people, right? It just it just putting your best foot forward. Uh, what's your profile picture look like? Like Gabby said, keg stand candy, Kenny or um appearance. Are you gonna go get a go to, go to a Tommy Guns tonight and get a nice get a nice fade and uh, and and trim up that beard or or maybe uh, perhaps um, whatever doesn't matter. <laughs> I I I honestly I I don't like I hate everything about this. I hate that we have to we have to dress a certain way or we have to talk a certain way or we have to um, clean ourselves up to, to to someone else's standards to make them feel comfortable with us. I absolutely hate it. I do believe that you should be yourself and who you want to be and act the way you want to act. The the problem is, is the world is the world, the way is the, the way that the world is. It is what it is. You can't control it. And I came to that realization on my own. And I said, you know what, as much as I don't like this, I know I got to do it. And it, your stubbornness or your, your, your position on that is hindering you from getting the opportunities that you deserve, from getting the things that you want most out of life. So there are sometimes there are just things that you cannot control and um, you just have to accept them. Yeah. Serenity prayer, baby. Dog grant me. Okay. I also just want to stress that um, because I know that this conversation does make people feel uncomfortable because there's, um, I think mostly it's if you're in the mindset of that you don't need to or you shouldn't have to change to become something. And that, um, you know, if you're in that mindset, then I think you have some growth to do. Um, sorry if that comes across wrong. But I think that if any of us want to grow, and want to want something that we don't currently have, and I know you're all here because of that, you want something more, then you need to think about the successful version of that person and what are they like? What, how do they dress? How do they talk? How do they think? What kind of decisions do they make? And if that successful person who is living the dream life that you want is a little bit different than you right now, then you have something to aspire to. And it doesn't mean that you need to change your values or your morals or anything along those lines. It just means that you get to like level up a bit and that you get to decide what parts of yourself need a little bit of improvement to become that person. So it's not about changing because the version of you is shitty and like that, like, like, come on, buddy. Like you really think you're going to make it when you look like that. It's not about that. It's about, it's about thinking of and aspiring to a, a better version of who you are on the, on that inside of that core values. Becoming the best version of yourself. We don't, um, we don't want you to change. We don't want you to change who you are because the best parts of who you are are what make you who you are. And we don't want you to change that. I think all of us are unique and there's a reason why people love us for, for being unique. And if we were all the same, it'd be boring as shit. It's just, we want you to be who you are, but we want you to become the best version of yourself. And when you look ahead to think of, you know, uh, being the type of person that owns 20 properties with five joint venture partners, um, is this current version of myself the type of person that would be able to do that? The type of person that people trust, the type of person that could manage something like that, the type of person that can manage that level of stress. There's a lot of growth that's involved with becoming an entrepreneur and a real estate investor, and you need to become the best version of yourself. And it doesn't happen overnight. You go through different revision, revisions. Think about it like Windows. There's Windows 95, there's Windows 97, there's Windows 2000, there's Windows better XP. And better. better and better and better. Some some nerd, some IT guy is going to be like, ah, it's never gotten all that good. But I'm just saying that there's different revisions of yourself over time. And you're going to just get a little bit better, a little bit better, a little bit better. So every day, you just continue to keep auditing yourself and continue to keep working on yourself. And and, and I saw a comment from Testify about, um, you know, I don't need to be liked by everyone. Uh, honestly, you won't like everyone you meet either. So don't worry about how you people see you. I agree with that. And that actually leads me into something else is that um, 
as you continue to grow and as you become, become better and you develop, um, what you're going to notice is a lot of people aren't going to like you. Um, not everyone is going to be receptive to it. And that can actually be a huge, um, that can actually prevent people from becoming better and becoming the best version of themselves. Um, it's because suddenly you're going to notice that some people don't like it. They're not receptive. They don't, they want you to stay where you were. They, they don't like the fact that you are getting better and they are staying the same and they are going to resent you for that. It's part of the process. And one of my early mentors actually um, taught me something very important about that is that um, I need to start thinking more with this and less with this. And that's not everyone is going to like you and you need to be prepared for that. As you continue to grow, a lot of people are not going to like you. They're going to see you as some cocky bastard. They're going to see you as a, you think that you're better than everybody else, which I don't. I truly don't. I, I do have a bit of an ego and I, I do believe that I'm capable of just about anything. It's a good ego. It's a powerful ego. I use it as my superpower. My ability to, to have an answer for everything or to be able to know that I can solve anything is my superpower. Some people see that as I'm an egotistical bastard that thinks that he's better than everybody else. And it's not the truth. And that's going to happen. Some people are, you're going to outgrow some friends, some seasonal friends. They were meaningful to you in high school. They were meaningful to you before. And as you continue to grow, they will not be meaningful to you anymore. And they don't like you anymore. And that's okay. You just keep moving on. But I think about what's most important to me and the direction that I'm going and my goals. And what's most important is my family, is my ability to grow and become the best version of myself, to have the best life possible. My, my ability to provide for my family, my ability to have a good reserve in place to make sure that if I do fail, that my family is taken care of my ability to help others, my ability to teach other individuals on how to have the same level of success, success and life that we have to build something. That's what's most important to me. Anyone who disagrees with that, who doesn't like that, they're not worth my time. And I want you guys to think the same way because it can be a little hard when, when friends start saying stuff. When friends start saying, oh, buying properties now? What are you going to do this? You're going to do this? Are you gonna, oh, we think you're this? And it can really start to affect you and your confidence, your self-confidence. But just don't worry about it. It is what it is. It's them. It's not you. Think about what's most important to you and why you're doing it and focus on that. Anybody else? Being known as an expert. Wayne, I know that I'm letting you, you're, go, you're taking it too far, but I'm going to let you keep going because this is all really your jam. And these are our last two slides. <laughs> you have no choice. <laughs> it's my last two slides. I got 15 minutes. I can reel this in. I, I have a very, I've done this a few times. I've coached over 200 people. I think, I think this is, this is, um, I talk about creative real estate being that being my, my mastery and my, my expertise, but honestly it's, it's business and, and 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 personal growth, I would say, is probably my expertise. Uh, uh, numero uno or number number two. What you want, if you want people to trust you, if you want people to perceive you as an expert, what you want is you want your name to be associated with the expertise or associated with the thing that that's um, with real estate investing. When someone says your name, what do they say? When someone used to say Gabby, um, Gabby Hillier years ago, they would think uh, roller derby. Gypsy, was it? Gypsy roller? Gypsy roller. When's your next game? How's, um, how's, uh, how's, 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 how's your job? You're, um, you work at the hotel, right? Yeah. Gabby used to be a reservations uh, coordinator. Then she was a revenue manager for three boutique hotels in Edmonton um, before she left. How's that? How's your daughter? These are the conversations that things that people bring up with Gabby years ago, because that's how they knew her for. That was when you think Gabby Hillier, that's what you associate it with. Right? What do people say about Gabby Hillier now? What's going on with the real estate market? When's the next time you're holding one of those women's circles? Right? When people used to say Wayne Hillier, what'd they say? Jeopardy? Ball hockey? oil industry, like weld inspections, my job, right? How's things going with work? How's things going with the, the industry, the oil industry? Is, it, is, it, you think it's, is there lots of work going on? Any ball hockey tournaments lately? Right? They say my name. That's what they associated it with. What do you think people say now? 
when they ask me about what's going on right now, or when someone says my name, or when when someone's talking about real estate, they're like, oh, I know a guy. He, he's, he teaches it. He's, he's, he's done tons of deals. Oh, yeah, you got to talk to this guy, right? What I want is I want people to be talking about me when I'm not around. When someone brings up real estate, I want them to say my name. Because that's what it, people associate it with. In the previous slide, you said, you know, your brand, your brand is you. It's not the logo behind me or this, uh, I don't know if you can see it, this goofy, uh, you know, real estate investor dad thing. That's not, that's not, that's not my brand. It's this right here, right? When someone says my name, what do they say? Right? I am known as an expert. It, it took a little bit of effort. I know lots of people actually um, that have been investing for as long as we have, Um and as smart or smarter, and nobody knows who the heck they are. And that's kind of a that's kind of a hindrance because that's they don't get the same level of opportunities that I get. So you kind of have to put yourself out there, right? You have to be known as an expert. So you start off by like, do you talk about what's going on or what you're doing in real estate investing? Do you talk about it with your friends? Do you share it online? Right? That's a great way of showing people what it is that you're doing. You have to, people need to know. People need to know what it is that you're doing. Otherwise, they won't know there's an opportunity to work with you. You have to share it. You have to wear it, right? Share it and wear it. Put it on socials. Talk about it. Don't shove it down their throats where like, oh my God, I hate talking to that guy because all he ever talks about is my little real estate is doing whatever else. You don't want to like overwhelm people, but you want, what I want is I want people to talk about me. I want people to ask about it when I, when, when I show up, right? What are you, what's your name? Like, what do they ask you about? Are they going to ask me about ball hockey and Jeopardy? Did you hear Alex Trebek died? <laughs> or are they going to ask you what's going on, right? I want people to come up to me and ask me about it. I don't want to shove it down their throats. So be very strategic about sharing it and wearing it, you know, in the early days and becoming known for it. And then people will bring it up to you. And then if they're interested in it, they'll ask, right? I'm keeping it on time. You just got to keep those slides going, baby. <laughs> Trust building. So do you want me to take this, Gabby? What is the difference between someone finding out that you're an investor versus you telling them that you're an investor? This is what I've been talking about for the last couple of minutes. Nobody likes to be told anything. It's just human nature. Nobody likes to be told they want to find out for themselves. How many of you are married? How many of you have told your significant other something and they're like, mm. And then they, then they went and talked to their friend or somebody else. And then they, they told them to do it. And then they went and did it anyways. And they said, it's because their friend did it. Nobody wants to be told what to do. Nobody wants to be told anything. Everybody thinks they're the smartest person in the world. And everybody wants to figure it out for themselves. So if you're telling people all about real estate all the time, just shoving it down their throats and telling them what they need to do, and you shouldn't buy that or anything else, they're never going to want to hear it. That's, and, and you might not even be doing it that way. You might be doing it in a way like just offering in a really polite tone or sharing some information with them. They don't want to hear it. It's just human nature. People are just, they think that they're always right. And that's it. Though I don't like it, we don't like it. It is what it is. And that's just human nature. So it's part of the rules of the game. So if that's the case, then set yourself up for success and just share, show them what it is that you're doing. Right. Can I? Can I give a little example of how like getting rubbed the wrong way with somebody shoving something down your throat like that? We um, just had some renovations done and there was a, a, a one of the contractors was a carpet installer. Oh, God. <laughs> and so he comes in and he's doing his measurements and stuff. And he's like, oh, yeah, you should, I, I'm going to show you all these uh, pictures of these uh, projects that I did. Hold on, hold on. Uh, let me just uh, pull up. I, I run my whole business on uh, on Facebook. So I'm just going to pull up my thing on Facebook. Oh, yeah, all my business. I do everything through Facebook. Let me just pull. Actually, do you have your phone? Uh, uh, you have Facebook, right? Yeah, you get your phone. You get your phone. Okay, my business is blah, 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 and tells the business name. He's like, oh, yeah, you're on it. You just hit hit follow or hit um, like, and then my stuff will show up for you. And you can, and like, really just like pushy, pushy, pushy. And so every time that we had to see this guy who's like all in, in my face about like, oh yeah, my business and a bit like seriously, like the three or four times that I saw him, he continued to tell me about how he runs his whole business on Facebook and that, 
and he wanted to show me the newest pictures of his newest projects and just kept like going hard and going hard and going hard. And did this guy do a really great carpet job? Yeah. Yeah. Looked fantastic. Excellent job. Didn't stuff any walls, didn't do anything. Looks great. Cleaned up. I would have recommended him. Would have recommended him 100%. Will I ever say his name to anybody? And will I ever hire him again? Nope. Absolutely not. He was so, he was shoving it down the throat so hard that it was just like, made you want to throw up everywhere is like just too much too much had he just mentioned his thing or left his business card and done a good job 100 percent, i would have went and found his page liked it and recommended him to other people and hired him again if i needed to yeah right so that's the difference between telling somebody and keep shoving it and shoving it and shoving it versus just being you doing your thing putting some stuff on social media, letting people see it, just showing up as as that person, right? I'll admit, um, if I were uh, born earlier, I don't know if we would have been as successful in real estate um, if we didn't have the ability of marketing ourselves for free on social media. I Because it was a completely different game before. It was showing up in your suit and very professional in your business card. And hello, I'd love to have coffee with you. And I would have had to have coffee with every single individual and tell them all about who I am and why, like how great I am. I, it wouldn't have, it would have been so time. It wouldn't have been, it would have been so unproductive as far as time goes, you know what I mean? To have to have all those meetings and I wouldn't have been able to reach nearly as many people. And I wouldn't be able to show people what it is that I do other than like showing them pictures, like, or like, you know what I mean? Like taking them down to our projects or our rental properties. They wouldn't have known because I would have had to tell them about how great I am and all these other things. But the fact that I was able just to take a picture and show people every day what it is that I'm doing, and I don't really shove it down people's throats. Our content's very different now than like, you know, than it was years ago. But before it was just like showing people what we're doing, like, hey, we're changing locks and we brought our daughter and everyone's like, oh, that's so cool. You know what I mean? Like, I, I didn't tell people like, you know, invest with me or like, or check out this opportunity. We just did a picture every day or a little bit of education every day. And then just people, um, people would just scroll past it and they might not even read it. You know, I never wrote anything this long because I know people aren't going to read it. They're just driving by. They're just going like this. So what I, what I want them to see is I want them to see the consistency of every day that Wayne and Gabby are doing stuff or Wayne and Gabby know stuff because it's kind of like, um, they're just like they 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 see it they retain it it's just there they see it they retain it it's there and after you know a year of seeing it every day wayne real estate wayne real estate wayne real estate wayne family real estate wayne real estate the next time they talk to me what's going on with this real estate that's it it's just subliminal messaging it's just marketing that's our marketing department i i don't have a marketing director or marketing coordinator uh my marketing is just it's just the billboard that is social feeds right and I'm just, it's just the same as driving by a billboard every day. Ooh, cool. Real estate, that lady. Cool, cool. This lady sells uh, the, this neighborhood. Cool, cool, cool. So in, in three months from now or a year from now, when I'm thinking about selling my house, I'm like, oh, this is, she's the realtor to call. You know, it's just, it's just drive by marketing. That's all I'm trying to do is I'm just trying to sh consistently show people that Wayne knows something about real estate. So whenever they think about it or wherever they're talking about real estate, they think of me. That's it. It's just simple marketing. That's all. You don't have to go overdo it. You don't have to create all this fancy Alex Harmozy, you know, Instagram, you know, everything else and make it all polished and stuff. All you're trying to do is just share the message that you are an expert. You're just building trust indirectly. And I don't have to shove it down people's throats. Plain and simple. That's it. So if, if someone is interested in you, uh, your reputation will precede you. I don't have to prove shit to anyone because they've already done it. I don't have to prove anything. I've already built the trust indirectly every single day by creating a little post or by showing up professionally, right? It, I, I'm telling you, like, it's if, if social media rubs you the wrong way, I'm sorry. But like, I'm telling you, if I didn't have it, I probably wouldn't be as successful as we are today with being able to raise capital, with being able to build trust with people. Um, I would have had a lot of trouble. We would, it's, it is what it is. And, and again, we don't get to write the rules of how people react. We don't get to write the rules of the way that the world is. The way the world is, the way that the world is, you can't change it. I mentioned the serenity prayer earlier. God gave me the 
the uh, the strength to um oh, I always mess it up. <laughs> I, always mess it up. I don't know why I even bring it up. You need to accept to the speak. things that I cannot change. And the wisdom to know the difference. To change the things that I can, to accept the things that I cannot change, and the wisdom to know the difference. It is what it is. Now, there are things that I can't control. And then I accept the things that I cannot. It is what it is. I, I wish I could change the way that the people react. I wish I could change the people. I wish that I could talk about who I am and what it is that I'm doing and people not get annoyed by it. Just people do it. And people talk to me about all the things they're doing and I kind of get annoyed by it too. And my wife tells me I should be doing things or I should be taking these these vitamins or I should be um, I should be getting more of this in my life or I should be doing this. And I'm like, ah, just please leave me alone. <laughs> and the same for her <laughs> and the same for you and your spouse and your relationships and your kids. Your kids don't want to hear it from me either. It's just, it is what it, it is what it is. We can't control it. So understanding is the first step. The next step is, is accepting it and do what you need to do in order to build the trust with the people that you want to build trust with. Um, so that when an opportunity does present itself for you to share it with them or not, or you share an opportunity with and, and it's presented to them, the work has already been done. The groundwork has already been laid. The foundation is there. And if they want to invest with you, they will. If they don't, they don't. Just move on to the next person. Joint ventures are, if you if you break down joint ventures as simply as we have today, they're very simple. Very, very easy and simple. Don't overcomplicate it. If you take a joint venture course and they're trying to tell you to do all this other stuff and you need to have a newsletter and you need to have a website and everything else, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, there are tools that you can use, there are resources that you can use in order to build trust. But at the end of the day, you just need to present yourself as a respectable, trustable person, right? And if they want to do business with you, they will. Plain and simple. After that, it's just a numbers game. Hey, you guys, that is a wrap on day one. Um, there was a question in the comments okay. about um, whether tomorrow's like a repeat of today or a continuation, and it's a continuation. So tomorrow we're going to be um, talking about the different uh, strategies that can be used in real estate investing, as well as how much money you can make from those um, opportunities. So that'll be the big focus of the day. And then as mentioned at the beginning um, of today, is that at the very end, if you want to stick around, we'll be going over um, the real estate investing master's mentorship program and what's included in that, if it's something that you're interested in investing in. And um, there'll also be kind of like a special bonus for anybody attending this course. So um, yeah, we hope we hope to see you back tomorrow. It'll be 10 a.m. Mountain time. We'll yep. see you then. And it'll be a bit shorter of a day. We're going to try to wrap up before one o'clock. <laughs>